And it comes down to things like communication skills, things mm. of like, and I'm quite small. I'm not tall. I always thought being great leaders about your height because of the presence in the room. No, it's mm-hmm. actually how you come across with your body language to different people. Some people you may need to motivate. Some need to a quiet word. You know, this is where management skills are massive. So hopefully what, what I'm explaining with my journey, I'm trying to integrate, weave in the lessons that are still pliable when we're adults. But I, I don't know about you, Tush, but I find like when we're adults, we forget that we were children once and we can yeah. use our past to our advantage, not our past as victims. That's what a lot of us, and I've mm. been in that shoes. Hello everyone, welcome to the Sports Lost Edge podcast. My name is Tushar Kathere and I'm the host for today's episode. In this episode, we have our guest, Mr. Ed Boyens, who is right now in England. He has his own podcast, his sports career podcast. He's also founder of the education to sports.com. So first of all, Ed, welcome to the Sports Lost Edge podcast. How are you? I'm very well, Tusha, and it's great to be here. And as I said before we went live, it's nice to be behind the mic in a different seat for a change. So thank you very much for being for me to be a guest today. And I look forward to today's conversation. Yeah, it's been a very long time. I think uh, we talk in the month of March at the time. And it's been a very, quite a lot of uh, quite a gap. And I think we already went to the 10 episode, which is such a huge thing for me because it just started as a small project. And yeah, I'm thinking to let's continue with this. Maybe I think this is we will have 20 or 30 episodes. So we, I have to work really hard and I have to manage my time also because right now working as a full time lawyer as an independent because I'm also preparing for my solicitor exams also. So I have to manage my time at that. So yeah, let's see what will happen this season. Tasha, can I just intervene a little bit? I remember when I hit episode 10, seriously, mm-hmm. till this day, which was somebody called Martin Robert Hall. And mm-hmm. I said to myself, how am I going to get 20 episodes? How am I going to get 30 episodes? And then the big mountain you're on now is getting to episode 100. So if you don't mind, that's the challenge for you, because when you reach there, mm-hmm. you will find your rhythm. So uh, I'll probably give some podcast tips throughout this conversation. But no, seriously, uh, congrats to getting to episode 10 and and I, and I say this because um when I started my podcast somebody said to me a lot of people who start a podcast quit at episode mm. 7 so there are so many podcasts out there and a lot of them quit by episode 7 because people just don't know the hard work behind the scenes like anything uh, any mm. project um it's same as any content creation but I feel like podcasting there they're sort of extra components uh, yeah. to make it a great listening experience. So congrats to getting to episode 10 and just keep going, my friend. Keep going. Keep doing the reps. Yeah, thank you so much for your kind words. So let's start our podcast. So the first question. So how is the journey started from school to the Durham University? And why did you choose to make your career in the, the sports industry? So how did it happen for you? Sure. Um, so I don't want to go lo- too long-winded, but I think it's important to paint the picture to the listener of my career journey so I always go back to when I was 12 I don't want to go into too much details but I think it's really important because it's such a significant period of my life so at the age of 12 I my parents divorced um Mm. I was always always already dyslexic and I had to leave school due to that and then finally I actually uh, fractured my spine I had spinal surgery at 12 and you're thinking how's this relevant well I wasn't, sort of, shall we say, naturally gifted in the classroom. I really mm. wasn't. I, it was only when I was 11, I used to go to extra, like an extra school during the summer, like a summer school, where and I have to give credit to my parents here. We had a, uh, like an apartment in Mallorca. They sold that apartment for me to go to this other school in London. And it really helped with my English massively. Tashi, I have no idea how bad my reading was at 12 it was half the age so I had a reading age of six so you're thinking how is this relevant sport was the only thing Tasha that I could express myself I played rugby at the time played tennis at the time uh, it was quite funny I used to play rugby on a, on a, on a Sunday right mm. and then I used to play tennis with my muddy knees straight afterwards I, I was playing two sports 
Uh, I played other sports as well, but rugby and tennis were the two that I um, was very passionate about. Um, te- rugby, due to my father, we, we I used to play for London Irish, which is a part of their academy system. And with regards to tennis, I started that in Mallorca on the clay courts, loved it. And, and that's how I got involved in it. Even the coach in Mallorca, I literally borrowed a racket, hitting the ball against his office wall, which I didn't know. He loved how I was hitting the ball. He got me on the court. And that's where I got my first racket in clothes. And that was the age of seven. So I was playing tennis and rugby and all sports. But really, if we keep in things at school, um, at St. George's Junior School, like for me, people knew me for, for being a great sports person. Like wasn't always the best, but I played hockey. I, I was in all the teams. But from an academic standpoint, now we are talking 12 here. We're not talking about degrees later on, but. At that time, it was so frustrating when I was in the classroom. I just couldn't thrive. There's nothing worse when you can't thrive, not compete with anybody else, but you can't actually, um, you know, influence your work in another sort of talent. And, you know, it doesn't matter what the subject was, Tasha. It didn't matter. It was math, science. Forget about languages. French was such a struggle. But, yeah. You know, for me, it's it, 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 it's more motivation was low, confidence was low. So every time you walked in a classroom, I'm like, oh, my gosh, how, how am I? But thankfully, due to, I had good manners. Um, I still gave as much effort as I could. And that was through the lessons of sport, because sport is, you know, a language in itself. Like, I'll stick to rugby because that was a sport I had to quit after my spinal operation. Like, to be clear, everybody... Mm. I have metal in my spine. So this is something that going back into contact sport like rugby, it was my insurance was, it was serious. I have insurance on my spine. I can't do the risk. So you have no idea how gutting it was to, to Mm. quit that sport. But I moved schools then I was at Ship Lake college and, uh, well, actually no, before that I went to a prep school system. Uh, This is a whole story to self, but I had to leave school due to this dyslexia went to a prep school system, which is a totally different system, education Mm -hmm. system to the school I was previously before. So it meant I finished at 13, not 12. So at Mm -hmm. 13, I leave. And then I went through the prep school system, went to Ship Lake. So Sunningdale took me for two years, like not many schools take you for two years Mm -hmm. and then help you get to the next stage. And then went to Ship Lake. And I'm going to go this uh, like journey of my education because it's quite important. So when I was there, um, I had E's, F's, I actually got into the school due to an interview. Okay. And how is this is important? You know, I do careers, an interview out of school or an interview for a job, it's the same process. So the one thing I did have, and again, through sport, going back to my days where I could play no spinal operation, I was, I looked, I, I was like reflecting, I was captains in a lot of my sports, hmm. a lot of them, even like hockey and and I'm thinking, why is that? You know, like, I don't want to praise myself. I was trying to find the patterns of behavior. And it comes down to things like communication skills, things mm. of like, and I'm quite small. I'm not tall. I always thought being great leaders about your height because of the presence in the room. No, it's mm-hmm. actually how you come across with your body language to different people. Some people you may need to motivate. Some need to a quiet word. You know, this is where management skills are massive. So Hopefully what, what I'm explaining with my journey, I'm trying to integrate, weave in the lessons that are still pliable when we're adults. But I, I don't know about you, Tash, but I find like when we're adults, we forget that we were children once and we can yeah. use our past to our advantage, not our past as victims. That's what a lot of us, and I've mm. been in that shoes as well, which is not a good sort of a mindset approach. So going back on this journey, as you asked me from school to university and then sports industry, I always, when I got to Ship Lake, year nine is a bit where you just figure out which subjects. So mm. that's where I was the lowest in every class. And I just remember this is really important because this is a private school. Like, let me be clear. Like, again, mm. my parents went, oh, my gosh, more privates. Like, my father said to me, and he's retired now. He said, Ed, you got to realize your private education was like a second mortgage. And when he said that to me, now mortgages Whoa. are quite high. And you go, I'm like, oh, my yeah. gosh. So... When I was at Ship Lake, I remember always remember my mum getting to my eye level. So mm-hmm. was, you know, she got on her knees. She said, "If you want to stay, you'll work hard." And um, it was sort of like that. It was this one moment, and I always remember it because it was the bottom of Burr House. And I said, "Well, this is where real work begins." And yeah. I'm not here to praise myself, or but I'm 
at, at Shipley, what I loved about their school for philosophy was they mm. had effort awards and uh, academic awards. So to keep things simple, A1 meant A due to the academia of the grade, and yeah. then one was top effort, and it goes one for five. And um, this is this is so true. You can check the records if you like. Touch you probably won't because uh, <laughs> but from year nine to year twelve, I got every effort award in my year. So five years consistently, I didn't like. I I, I put everything in, even if I was in set five, I was still getting the awards. And again, I look at patterns of behaviour. That was a controllable, and I say that your effort is a controllable. It yeah. just shows. It just it's all about how you show up on the day, mm. um, and you're going to have off days. But um, why am I sharing that with you? When I was um, at Ship Lake, we'll talk about sports injury very soon, but this is really important. Pick my subjects. P was always going to be um, on my, you know, like the sort of not modules wrong. It was going to be one of the subjects I was going to learn because, mm -hmm. again, I was fascinated about what sport could provide with life yeah. lessons. But really, I actually found the Olympic movement fascinating. Like, I was actually yeah. always interested in history, by the way, too. That was another subject I've always enjoyed um, as well as a subject matter. But the history of sport, I always found curious. Now, you've got to realise we're talking about yeah. like, oh, God, you're testing my knowledge, 2008 to 2011. So yeah. things aren't, you know, social. I always remember Mindspace. I joined Mindspace when yeah. I was at Shift Lake, you know. So you've got to really just put, paint the pictures over it. There was <laughs> Facebook was around. Twitter was just about around. But the tech wasn't, social media wasn't where it is today. Sure. So, uh, but what was really good with my P, I was so lucky enough. And he is a mm. podcast special guest. Um, had somebody called Shane O'Brien, who was a mm. gold Olympian for New Zealand back at the uh, Montreal Olympics. Mm, and yeah. he was my PE teacher. Like, and he's six foot eight. He was a giant on the mat. He, I'm not joking. He has a bit of a uh, sort of a body built Arnold Schwarzenegger, that sort of lean, mm. big presence. And he was the deputy head as well. And he was like, to have a teacher like that who's been there, done, and this is, just to be clear of it, this is. I would say amateur Olympics. He had mm -hmm. part-time jobs whilst competing for the Olympics. It's not yeah. what it is now where they get funding. No way mm. now. This is, I would call the real Olympics in regards to its um, prestigiousness of, you know, the top athletes, amateur sort of, not amateur of how they showed up. I mean, what the Olympics was founded by, all of its principles and ethics. You know, it's all about you compete uh, yeah. for, for, for what sport is about. So that really was inspiring, uh, to have him as my PE teacher. Just, I went, I, I was so curious, but mm. at that time when I was studying, I have to be honest, I was thinking, well, where are the, where are the jobs in sport? Yes. I did a lot of tennis coaching, by the way, I had a tennis scholarship. I won't go in that story, but mm. tennis wise, I had a scholarship somewhere whilst at time at ship Lake. So I was always playing every week. But all I knew was a job, really, like through the eyes, my eyes, mm -hmm. were you could only be like a coach or a PE teacher. There was mm -hmm. it didn't really open up the door of professional jobs, you know, in the sports industry. So I I always knew sport was going to be after time at Ship Lake. And by the way, you know, I told us bottom of the class when I left. Mm -hmm. um, I always remember I put in my applications because in year 12, I was averaging A's and B's. Huh? Mm -hmm. Told you from the beginning. I left. I got into the school to do an yeah. interview, but and this is where effort beats talent. Mm. Um, one of my tennis coaches, Paul Brighton, taught me that he was my tennis coach at Wentworth. He's like, honestly, hard work beat talent every day. And I know this sounds all cheesy and cliche, but when you actually 100%. experience it, yeah. experience it yourself. Um, same as podcasting. I, you know, it's, I, I've just modelled it just as a different mm. methodology. It's just with a podcast mic, not with a tennis racket or with a pen yeah. um, to do essays. But going, so near 12, I was like, okay, so what did I do? Just to give people a picture, I did business B-Tech, because I've always found mm. business interesting. Um, I did history, mm -hmm. PE, and then art. Um, art's a great one because <laughs> I actually got a, a, an A star for that. So I started with a B. And then I'll just kept, I, I, this is, I'll decode this through because this is so important. It's, it's been a game changer of how I perform. Mm. With art, you have these massive A4 pads, a huge touch. Like um, yeah. Mrs. Anderson, who I was a teacher, she, um, Miss Andrews, I should say, was a teacher. We had to do 
in year 12, three of these pages a week. And then year, year uh, sorry, year, yeah, year 13, we had to do four. I went, you're hmm. kidding me? Like all of us went, and we used to do like the old, um, I'm, I'm giving them, make, make this a bit of a fun story. We would allow one of those pictures pages of just photos mm. so as you can imagine a lot of people did photos to buffer up the books yes. and she said no 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 in year 30 you have to do four quality people oh my we're all like this so this is so true what i'm about to say those two years because it was a boarding school i always stayed mm. i didn't go home um mm. during the weekends and it was we had saturday school gosh i sound really old we had saturday school yeah. till 12 p.m and then we had sports and then sunday was a day off I used to do an additional six hours uh, mm. in the art room every weekend. I mean, from year 12 to where year 13. And this is a really key story I'm about to share. So I, don't, I haven't shared this on a podcast yet. And all it is is all about getting an A star. But I started with a B at the beginning. Mm. Why am I getting a B? Like, I got an A in GCC. So I went, right, we've got to up my game. So I did six hours every weekend. Nobody knew about mm. it. i just go in the art room, crack on music, you know, headphones in. And eventually, and I saved time with this. This is going to sound mm. crazy, story, but so true. I saved time because um, while my grades were improving and my writing was improving as well, by the way, because you have to write essays with certain artists you get inspiration from. Mm-hmm. I literally, um, I got, it was the final term where I had my big pads, art pads, and Miss Andrew said, you're done. I went, done? I said, and bear in mind, I only had one exam. I said, what do you mean I'm done? So she said, you've done your books. Like, and I, this was a month and a half to the end of Whoa. the term. A month and a half. And I went, you, you mean I'm finished? Like, 100%. She said, yeah, Ed, you, you, you're done. I'm like, and everybody else was like trying to finish their pads by the end of a certain deadline. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I thought about this, and I, I can't do the maths, but I think with those a month and a half, that, mm-hmm. all that time, Without a doubt, I saved that with those six hours in the, you know, six hours every weekend. Um, there was a funny story. She she would have given me Saturday detention if I didn't go home for my 18th birthday. That was the only weekend I had off. But it just taught me about you hear about people going, doing the reps or putting the extra hours, all these motivational stuff. When you do it, this is my one example, Tasha, I go back to because I um I remember when I put in my applications for university, uh, mm. for I, I went Bath, Durham, I can't remember the others, but Durham's a big deal in the UK. Yeah. It is literally just below, they say, Oxford and Cambridge. So when I put in my application, uh, another funny story, when I was putting them in, went to my granny's village, a good friend called Robin, he, he used to be part of the university, he said, oh, uh, Robin, I'm going to put Durham as your, my second choice. He looked at me going, Durham is your second choice, you must be mad. <laughs> He said, you do not put Durham as your second choice. I went, okay. I took his advice, put it as my first choice. And um, story really short, I, I got in. And mm. you have no idea. To, you, seriously, from the age of 12, which I said, a back operation, parents like left school dyslexia pretty mm. much. You have no idea. Uh, and there was actually, when I was 12, I had people say I couldn't get to uni. I know those names. I will not say them out. But there are people mm. who, who said I couldn't get to uni. And I was... And I'm like, no, nah, I'm going to prove you wrong. Like that underdog approach. Um, and that's not really healthy. I have learned it's not a healthy thing. It's, it's good to a point uh, from a motivational standpoint. But but then you learn that there's more better fulfillment or better gratitude approach mm, to achieve right. a goal. So um, it's all about like justice versus revenge. You know, there's that, that's another conversation itself. But it's that sort of attitude. I, mm. I learned um, when I... And I've always remembered, Tush, I got to reception at school. So I actually went back to my school ship like, to get my grades. I could have waited for the buzz. I went, no, I'm going to go mm. back because that's what you all did. And I remember going to reception. I got my guys like, with my art, with all my grades, but this A star, I'm like, I thought they put the asterisk wrong. And I said, <laughs> A star? I went, oh, wait. Yeah, I was like, I was just blown away. I like, you have no idea. Like that, yeah. that got me more than into Durham. That, that A yeah. star was like, it got me more than what was required because uh, mm-hmm. i got dissertate i got a distinction in my business btech i got a b and p actually a lot, a lot down in my grades and that which is still a bit gutting but then the a star so i was well in durham like didn't sneak in i absolutely killed it to get in and and this is a thing where when people and i'm gonna go deep here because i think it's important because things have changed 
Mm. from where I did my degree at that period of time to where things are. There's a lot of conversation. Should you do degree? Should you do master? Yes, if it's relevant to the journey you want to go on. Yeah. To a point, like creative. For me, I did sport, exercise, and physical activity. Um, I wanted to carry on this sort of curiosity of sport mm. because my de- what I did at PE or A level PE is yeah. not even the foundation. You're not even scratching the surface. You're not scratching the surface on the sports science things. Mm. Um, sociology there wasn't much. Psychology, like I wanted to go big on this subject, but more sports science. The mm. sport management, like unfortunately, none of my PE um, sort of work had nothing on sport management. So can you imagine? It's very difficult to relate to something if you haven't been exposed to any of the subject. Mm. And I always say that to somebody. I was like, "Well, have you been exposed to that topic or anything?" And they go, "No." I went, "Well, you got to experience it." So going back to sport management, which is very popular now, at the yeah. time, I had no, I had no textbooks on that topic. Mm. Probably the only one we did do, we decoded um, the the Olympics in the USA because it was the first ever Mm. uh, Olympics that had commercial rights, had McDonald's sponsor. That's where it was a whole game changer. And, you know, you're testing my subject, you're testing my uh, history of Olympics. But my point is that was the first time they got commercial money into the Olympics, which Mm. then professionalized the Olympic Games in so many different avenues. But that was it. But other than that, I had no exposure. I had to carry on this route of, but but going from Ship Lake to Durham, I'm not going to lie, mm. when I got to Durham now, put things in perspective, I'll, I'll use my hands. Like, I live here, like Surrey near London. Mm. Um, Oxfordshire's here, but Durham's yeah. up north. It's like near Newcastle. Up north, yeah. It's yeah. like, to talk, you know, football clubs, it's about a f- uh, five-minute train journey to Newcastle and then about 15 minutes if you're a Sunderland fan, you know, so it's colder, my friend, it is yeah. colder, like, yeah. and I got there to Durham, and, and it's about a six hour drive, my father mm. took me up, and he dropped me off, it's probably the furthest he's gone, like, this is past Yorkshire, where I have family, mm-hmm. and I got the Tusha, and I, I went, oh my gosh, I'm here, <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, you know, when you achieve a goal, and I, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to decode more than my journey, I'm trying to provide sort of lessons i'm doing a lot of reflecting by the way even with my personal development um so when i got to durham i, I got there going now what like and you sort of there's the not overwhelmed but it was that period of time going i've achieved this mountain yeah i need to create a new one if not i'm just going to drift and uh my goodness i got a wake-up call with the standard of academia work or standard of the way you write the stat the standard mm. of like english i was well out my comfort zone you have no idea uh like not not, not like the reading i loved i've got i've still got actually all my university books i still actually go back to them because they are great books but with mm. regards to uh, i do agree like academic writing is totally different to different. to like say writing in newspapers it's it's got its own style Mm. And if you don't understand the style of academic writing, it's a struggle because if you get the style right, they're more likely you're going to get a better mark because they're mm. academics marking your work. Like keep things simple, um, you know, in regards to processes and the way you're mm. doing essays. So I love my time at, at um, Durham. I really it was what I loved about it was it had the freedom to learn about sport in in real day. De- I mean, policy. Like, I had a guy from Canada who mm. was who um taught me how to do like how policies are are applied at mega events like the world cups like um come we we use cases from the commonwealth games i mm. learned about um australia um how australia run elite sport mm. how canada do elite sport and um how uh uk do elite sport like they, they are totally different systems and then of course yeah. the united states it's a totally different way of how they run elite sports one right. is due to population uh, and, and two it's more funding and how things are done like quick example um america it's mass participation they have so many people they yeah. have the the ability to cherry pick the best talent put them in a college system college system. That way. exactly yeah. but uk we have academies but the, the secret of the uk is is the lottery funding meaning we you know all the lottery tickets 
uh, that are sold, a percentage goes towards certain projects. And one of them is UK sport or to provide funding for these elite athletes. Like, that's a game changer. Like Amer imagine mm. America done that huge, but they already got big funding from the government. Yeah. You know what I mean? All these other, when you learn how elite sport is set up, um, it, like we, UK modeled um, Australia because, they're, you know, yes, they're a bigger country, but population we could mirror. So, uh, and that's why we're so good now in Olympic Games, consistent, even winter games, UK yeah. still show up and we don't have much snow, uh, except for like parts of Scotland and top of Wales. But mm. I would say me being from England, there's not many places you can get yeah. uh, a snow. Um, but that's where I loved my time at Durham. It just opened up my eyes, mm. opened up how research is done. Like the one thing I will share, because it, it has helped with my podcast journey, which I'll paint the picture, I'll talk about experience. Uh, my boxing thesis was on elite boxing. And mm. basically, I during my first year, I had I did four jobs to make money for my house, like where I was staying yeah. for second year, like rent. That was a great experience. It taught me about the lessons of trying, you got to earn money and, and the second year working hard on different jobs. So when people talk to me about experience, never be embarrassed if you're doing these jobs. I worked at a Lebanese restaurant, which I'm so proud of because mm. when you're working with customers, you know, I had to learn a Lebanese menu, my friend. Uh, yeah. The food is amazing, but I had to learn, is this prawn? Is this with garlic? Not garlic, because some of it was in English, but some of the details were in Lebanese. Um, it, it really improved my communication skills. So I always say to people, if you hear people who've said they've worked in cafes, worked in restaurants at college, you are actually improving your communication skills. You just don't realize it whilst you're doing it. You're probably yeah. at times really frustrated going, oh, I want to finish my shift. No, no, no. If you do, if you go with the right attitude and approach, mm. you actually can improve skill sets at the same time you're getting paid. Uh, that's the secret. Second year, though, you can happy to ask me questions on this, but... I actually did two internships. One was with Sky Sports, which yeah. was amazing. Um, it was with the rugby department during the British and Irish Lions tour in Australia. And mm -hmm. I was actually there, my friend, like the final week when uh, British and Irish Lions beat Australia. It was amazing. But I was actually doing some of the editing that went on their website. Mm. I managed to actually, sorry, I had the privilege to sit down in the studio for uh, nine hours watching rugby. What a Whoa. shame. <laughs> <laughs> so it was amazing. I'm joking. But it was like, I, I was sitting there going, Hmm. kidding me like but this is in the studio so it's a totally different right. so i had you know one i had one on the monitors which yeah. are out in australia and then i actually had the studio on the right hand side so i could watch the presenter prepare for his notes during half time the pundits uh at the time um who who went to the you know i actually went to their makeup room just to have a look and yeah uh, and i had to get a cup of tea for them and stuff so I, I was doing stuff but for me when you're in you know i was only there for 10 days but i learned so I, every day was like i had to capitalize as much as i could see learn mm. right listen listen more important than, than talking by the way but during that here's a little fun story i I was with the other interns and one of them was with Johnny Nelson's daughter. Oh. And um, she said, oh, my dad's a boxer. And I'm like, oh, you're kidding. I'm doing a boxing thesis. I was like, so I'm doing a boxing thesis. How to get, what, what, what inspires them to get in the ring? I'm like, can I meet him? Can I just meet him? Um, and I didn't know who Johnny Nelson was. I didn't know who mm. she really was. She said, no, no, introduce my dad. So I went in the canteen. Johnny Nelson, if you don't know who he is, he's a, presenter of sky of um the well boxing and he is about six foot five Ooh. and he turned around and went, he shook my i always say it's so true I, I gave my hand and i lost my hand his hand <laughs> was i literally lost my whole hand and i went and i said uh, hi mr nelson heard much about you um can i mm -hmm. just have five minutes of time to talk about my boxing project that i'm doing for my university sat down he knew one person who I mentioned, who, who inspired me to do it. Um, yeah. um, so it's a guy called Winston McKenzie. He's on my podcast. Uh, his cousin was Duke McKenzie, was a world champion. It's all very small world boxing. Yeah. And uh, he said, oh, you know, Winston, because he's a bit of a character, Winston, and uh, really admire what he's done in his career. And so I said, look, John, I, I just would love to interview, you know, some boxers for this project. I'm fascinated. I, like, bear in mind, I haven't got a bit of boxing history of my family I, I i want to challenge myself um just be clear i remember when it was uh this is so true this is honestly true here it was 2012 i was working with jana 
and I on the screen that allowed the TV on the Olympics, and I was lucky enough to watch Nicola Adams with her silver, um, the gold medal. She won the gold medal, but the semi finals to get into the mm. gold medal bout, Great. and I was just so inspired. Like she was my athlete of the year. She all during 2012, like her personality, her vibe, like her, her just technique at 2012. It was just so awesome to watch. Very special. Yeah. And I'm not even into boxing, but I was watching her. And the movement, um, you know, was so it was just effortless. And it isn't effortless boxing. There's actually an art to it. But I knew that semi-final bout, there was history between the other opponent because she beat Nicola in the World Champs. So it was a really important bout and Nicola beat her. So I was like, that's it. I'm going to do it in boxing. Did I, have no, did I know people in boxing? Only one person uh winston did i know about the sport nope did i know about the top gyms nope i just went i'm gonna do i'm gonna figure this out hmm. and uh to do a dissertation on it so when i spoke to john he goes yeah no i'll take to the sheffield gym i was like really i was like so he hooked him up with brendan ingle gym now if you don't know the brendan ingle gym it's really historic like uh, I'm, I'm going back really in past but the the top champion who's the most famous princess right. scene here if you he was on like PlayStation games. <laughs> um, he is famous for walking, but he actually had a phenomenal career itself. Uh, but he he was always famous for his ring entrances as well. And when I sort of went, oh my goodness! And it gets a bit of a smaller world. Hmm. Pr- Prince of Seams was based at Wentworth, where I was. Um, oh. Where I was going, and this is a small world even more. I actually coached his son tennis. I didn't know this at the time. I actually coached his son, so I had one phone hmm. call. Prince. It was part of the research project, but. I just mm. wanted to ask of his bit of his career and it was amazing, but I didn't really, the, the dots didn't connect at the time. Um, but I was like, Oh my goodness, how small world I'm coaching his son tennis. And now I'm off to Sheffield to speak to some of the other boxers. So I was mm. lucky enough to interview um, three world champion boxers at the gym and people who are like the next generation and watch them train. And it just opened my eyes about the sport. I honestly, Tasha, I, I don't like comparing like to like, but can I just say this? To be a boxer, I would say, Definitely. Yeah. you know, you are the, you know, the fitness levels, the mindset, the pressure, you know, you are an overall athlete because if yeah. you lose your bottom, you know, a football team, you've got next game to get three points back. Um, right. Tennis, you've got the next competition. Your mm. rankings may go down, but you're the next competition. But boxing, particularly the the higher bouts you know where there's more money on the line a lot mm. more on the line you know one knockout could can adjust a whole person's career you know right. but look a bit like aj when i was starting he was the next thing and he's had a phenomenal career but you can tell that when he's lost he he had to do a few bouts to get back um to you know for a bigger opponent to call him mm. out for a bigger fight so there's a lot more on the line and also the business side of things are significant too of how it's all distributed after a fight. So <clears throat> when I did my thesis on like what inspired, well, no, I'm not inspired, not at all. What motivated these boxers? Mm. And the, I won't go in my thesis, but the biggest thing was getting money on the table like any other job. Uh, but bearing in mind, you've got to realize in um, Asia, there are when, when people win, actually, they, they are in a different social class of living. Right. I, I, I always remember one study I found where, so I can't remember, I think it could be Thailand, where if you won, you know, you meet the, the like the royalty, you know, you meet the king of Thailand. And yes. when you meet <laughs> royalty, you, you're, you don't have to do much for the rest of your life because you have, you know, you are like a, a symbol to that country of right. what you achieved as a boxer, mm. um, as like an ambassador of the country, you know. So can you see like right. motivation <clears throat> can be mm. different? So I'm just going to glass water is different. So can you see like how fascinating I was with how boxing is such a sport that puts different perspectives of why people come in the ring. Right. But then I was lucky to, I'm going to do a cough, mate. I'm going to mute myself two sec. Thanks for that. Um, literally like you see, like this is what Reese, mm. I, this is what I'm a big believer about going to university you have a chance to be in a safe environment uh i had guidance to do topics that are so fascinating but if you like right. like you you're podcasting you want to be a sports lawyer. you don't have time to do a thesis on the side 
uh, to, to learn more about certain sports that um, of why the sport is where it is. And to mm-hmm. be fair, I had there was limited research at, right. at the time as well. So I don't be long winded this bit, but uh, but from a career standpoint, you know, meeting Johnny, create the networking, you go to Brendan Ingle, and I have to mention Brendan Ingle, he's not around anymore. Mm-hmm. And you have no idea how lucky enough I had. I had five cups of tea with him, and the, and I always share this story. This is so true. The first day, um, Sheffield is it's a bit hilly, but it's it was near yeah. a railway line, and the gym is on a slope, but on in a converted church. Okay, so imagine Ooh. a church, and yeah. then that's the boxing gym. It's got painted lines, which is painted in. No other gyms can copy it. This is where they do the footwork drills, and I remember the first day with my big pack back. My Durham Cokes, I wanted to know people felt safe with me in the room. Like, you have no idea how, you know, trust is massive in boxing. You know, if you're not in, if they don't know in the room, you get looks. I got looks. But when I had my Durham and I showed them, like, this is what I'm doing, trust was, I was putting them gloves. Brendan said, this is how you do it, son. And he was showing me how to do it. And, you know, and it was great to be part of it and be, yeah. be welcome. But I remember Brendan the first time I was walking up to the gym, going, am I here? And it's like a church. And I saw this old, man with a, a coal bucket now i don't know what coal bucket is but it's very rusty sweeping mm. up the floor i'm going now that guy brendan i got in there and go excuse me sir um i'm here to do a research project i'm here for brendan oh that's me i went i said oh. i should be doing that i'll be what yeah, I, I did take the brush off. oh no no i'll do it um but i just it why am i sharing this story he's doing the jobs that people don't see mm, right you know he's mm. doing a job where He's delivered over, I think, five world champion boxers, and he's doing the mundane jobs that nobody wants to do. Mm. You know, a sweaty, dusty gym, nobody wants to be, but he was doing it. And it was the first scene, and that hit the tone. And it taught you think you're thinking, well, how, how does this research project relate to the sports industry? Oh, yes, it does. Mm. Oh, yes, it does. Like, this was exposure of what it's like in the boxing industry imagine not just brendan but other gym owners other trainers right. who are doing the job so story really short with this and i have to finish off this because i'm a big believer of affirmations during when i gave in my thesis i was going mm. oh this is going to get a job you know i'm not going to lobby so true about it. i thought this project could when i gave a project to johnny nelson again that could me work with that department in sky that that was the the objective because i thought what i'd done was so different but anyway i um it never worked out, but when I dropped off my thesis, I met somebody called Alwyn Bulcher, oh. and uh, and I met Dominic Ingalls too. That's the son of Brendan. Yeah. Dominic now runs the gym now. Very scary guy, but I respect him a lot. He gave me some good life advice. Mm. But I was speaking to Brendan, and, I went, and and bear in mind, Durham they uh, they did like a boxing night in, in and it was for charity. And he said, "Oh, I've got three signed pictures of me and Nicola." I said, Brendan, I know, uh, I know you've just met me, but here's the thesis. Like, any chance I have those pictures and I can donate them to the boxing? It's for Durham. And honestly, I had three signed Nicola Adams um, oh. uh, pictures. And, and I, I literally went to the people and they were so over them. It made a really good bit of money for mm. that, that. Because it's, re- you know, you've got to realise the money from grassroots there's not a lot of money at the low end. Yes, yeah. you get inspiration, but you've got to realise from a, a world champion boxer, let's say AJ, get my hand here, to the bottom of the next, it's, it's so low to keep so low. keep gyms running. And then I said, and then he said, I said, you trained her? And, and he went, yeah, yeah. And he's about, gosh, he was about 67 at the time. Hmm. And I went, oh, so we've, we still keep in touch. And he said, Ed, I've got a surprise. This was about three months later because he loved my thesis. Hmm. My thesis got published as well. And in the front cover, I rang him going, look, I need a title for the for my book, for the thesis. I said, and I said, give me what he said, control the feet, control the fight. I went, that's it. That's yeah. the front cover. Because uh, I didn't use my actual thesis. But so he inspired me. Uh, I'll send you a copy, Tasha, of it, uh, my thesis. But it got published. He was mm. the one who named the front cover. And he said, hey, come two weeks. Come, come in two weeks. Got a surprise. I said, okay. And I wanted to give him a an actual uh, hard copy of my thesis, like published. Yeah. Pop, pop in the bag. I went, there's some punches in there. Who was it? It was Alwyn, Nicola Adams, oh. and another boxer. I watched her spar for 45 minutes. 
and it was just like it, uh, breathtaking. Now I didn't take a selfie. I feel a bit gutted, but I wanted yeah. respect. Like you got to realize, I did no selfies during that time. I wanted to right. had a quick chat with her. I uh, had some great like she said. If you know, she's so down to earth, and I uh, I watched her train with um, and Alwyn introduced me to them, and I was just just sitting there in awe. And my goodness, hmm. how she hits a bag. You have no idea the sound. I can still hear the sound. It was like consistent, but it was that sort of, it's like rhythm, but the mm. impact was the same. I don't want to clap on the mic, but it was like a hard clap, but consistent. And, um, and I, you know, and also there was the other boxer. So I had to respect her because I'm not going to just go just English. So I, the other box was amazing too. She was a bit taller, but they did a little bit of um, footwork, uh, more mm. body sparring. And I went, wow. And why am I sharing this so in-depth story? I told you, I saw her on a TV screen working in a restaurant. Did I ever imagine uh, working or seeing mm. her in person? No. But I am I, I'm learning these little things now. If you think about it enough, work on it a lot, you just don't know what's possible. Now, I don't want to be cliche. I've just given you real life stories that I mm. even look back now going, Ed, you've done this, you've proven it, and you you saw, I can give another one this year of a podcast special guest who I'm a big fan of, and it happened. So I, 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 what I'm trying to say is if you focus on what you really want, uh, and yeah. if you think you could meet that individual and you still believe in it, it is possible, because you have no idea that day when I saw it. Like, you have no idea the, the emotions I was going through, bearing in mind, yeah. Two years prior, I was working in a restaurant w watching her, you know, at the world stage in London on a television mm. screen whilst waitering in a, in a Lebanese restaurant. So this boxing thesis, by the way, was the like the great thing I had was it because I interviewed these athletes. Now, these are my first ever interviews. OK, mm. but I knew at the end they all enjoyed the experience. I went, I'm pretty good at this because it's not radio. It's not that yeah. most of these people in the media, mm. but how I did it, they felt comfortable, they felt safe, and mm. there was respect. Now, yeah. it didn't matter what sport it was, but they felt respect. Like, I gave them, it's funny, this is so true, Josh, I gave them all, I was like, I've got to thank these books, I gave them all cologne. Mm. And by God, they were happy people. I gave them, like, um, Calvin Klein colognes, all of them, and they were, like, really, and I think that's the thing, when you treat yeah. athletes how you like to be treated. It sounds so obvious, but you've got to realise elite sport a lot of athletes are used, a lot of athletes is business, a lot of athletes, they, you know, um, you, you've got, you, people don't see their sh side, like you, you could judge them saying, well, they get paid a lot. I said, yeah, they may get paid a lot, but do mm. they get treated the same as you get treated? You know, you walk on the street, you may have to yeah. sign 20 to 30 autographs, you know, right. or, you know, I don't have that. I walk up the street and I can just enjoy my own business. And I quite like being on mine at times to get, but those, they don't. So, it taught me perspective of different like there's one top athlete there who's part of the uh -huh. coaching and finishing his career. um uh what's his name oh it's coming back to me duke mckenna uh, duke sorry i need to get this there was a one of the older boxers who i did interview mm. it was amazing it's just gone gone his name which is a shame because he was a great great guy junior witter that's his name he was with brendan at the time mm. and um it was great to hear somebody who's being around the box he was a similar era to johnny nelson in the same training gym so i could yeah. say well how was it with you you know he said ed it was so much fun like yes it was professional brendan got us going but it was a really close unit and it was like family that sort of feel yeah. so um that that's that thesis to this day has been a, a huge you told me about stepping stones yeah of my career that was it like so i've talked about a piece of work okay i'm keeping it simple mm. to any students out there one piece of work was a huge pillar uh because it got me out of my comfort zone i had to network to get mm. there and that was sort of the stepping stones really for after now don't get me wrong i had a period of going what am i going to do next like everybody mm. faces that question yeah but i knew i did a few more internships mm. but then i just knew i wanted to provide a resource now do we carry on do you have any other questions tasha i have I've spoken a lot but yeah. this is sort of the next phase i'm going to give yeah. you the mic because um i've been in your shoes <laughs> <laughs> so but did you have any questions of 
before I move on. Um, no, please, please go ahead because I think uh, it's very natural that you're progressing and you told everything that required to work into the sports industry, like doing the networking, which you have done while you're preparing for your thesis. You have to go and meet with the athletes also and making them comfortable is one of the biggest thing that you can, that we as a people who are working in the sports industry, right? Because I'm also working with the esports athlete and it's a very new kind of industry because nobody's working in that region. And sometimes because they sometimes they feel low because um, esports is something which is more on a psychological basis and that's why working with this kind of people you have to be consistently be in touch with them so i used to ask how are you how are you doing right now what are things that you are working on it how your team is performing really well i always assure that in case you need any help just let me know give me a call just ping me on the whatsapp and whatever in my capacity what i can do i will fulfill for that so yeah, that's my, um, how to say, that's how I approach, I have my approach for my, for the clients or the future clients, which I have. And this is the only way that I uh, continuously progressing in my career right now. I just started my career, I think in just August 2022, I just started my uh, individual practice before that, before that I just doing the individual work, some associated with any organization doing a certain kind of projects or making some courses on uh, sports law. Yeah, so these are things but, that I was doing. But the key question you said is, how are you? You know, it may yeah. sound so obvious, but it's such a powerful one when answered right. A lot of people say, I'm okay. No, you want to mm. go in depth on that. And that's the same with me with working with these athletes. If it was yeah. a thesis, like I kept them up to date because they're mm. part of it. But moving on, like if it just, I'll carry on. I just wanted to double check yeah. because... I know, I know what it feels when you get talking on a mic, but yeah, literally I, after that thesis, I knew mm. I was on the right path in my career. Mm. It was hard looking back because I had some good life lessons. Like st another trip that's really important. Um, with my thesis, I sat down with Dominic Ingle and he goes, Ed, this is brilliant, but what are you going to do with it? And I said, well, I hope I get a job at Sky. As I said earlier, he goes, Ed, you're not going to get a far if you're going to rely on somebody else to get a job. It hit home and all was opposite. My mm. confidence was here and it went right down. I literally left and, it, and, it, and I remember all going, you're right, son. I went, yeah, I think uh, I needed that though. That was something like what your father or mother would give you, like a proper yeah. pep talk in life. And I said, I've just had that. And he said, look, he looked at me in the eye and said, prove him wrong. Not in like prove him wrong, like me getting to Durham, meaning like yeah. prove like that. He, he, he was right, Dominic. Let me be 100% mm. clear. It's just how he said it, it felt you know, he just said it how it was. He said he yeah. couldn't say it more blunt, but he he was right. When I was at the station, I had to regroup. Going, okay, got a great thesis. You're about to graduate in a couple of months' time. Um, and I went right. Let's just be honest. So I'm going to go through this quick because there's so many. So did Sky Sports, did Soccer mm -hmm. X uh, as well, and they're like a football event company. They they sort of been back. They they did liquidate, but now they're coming back. It's been rebought. Um, yeah. but my point is that was interesting because that's all about football industry. But then I got at Benchmark International, mm. which I was there for three months. It was only when oh. I was there, I literally, um, I had amazing experience. It's a great company to look at. They do beyond sport, beat sports and just Woods, uh, mm -hmm. beyond talent now, which they look at, they look after athletes like John Amici at the time, mm -hmm. Will Greenwood, uh, Baroness, Tony Gray Thompson. So to be in that room was just amazing. Now I could go in depth in this, but all I say during those three months, again, I had to work hard, uh, yeah. massively. I was, I was in, I was meant to be an intern for one month. I ended up being three mm. and I did everything from answering the doorbell, getting, I always remember printing paper mm. from, uh, John Lewis, which was four streets down the road in London, busy London. I, I felt like doing the strongest man competition with the yeah. heavy weights. Uh, but yeah, I just over delivered. Um, I really did. Uh, I wasn't always there first and fir first in and last out because you don't realize London commuting, you know, you don't want to miss yeah. trains, but I certainly gave it all my all. Mm -hmm. um, and it was only when I was there, I'm going, and when I was doing my commute, I'm going, there's no resource. There's nothing I can learn. I can't like, I'm learning yeah. from great people in the room. It like one of my favorite th things I did do at ben uh, Benchmark was it was the week that when I was there, they did mm. the judging for the BT awards and Nick yeah. look, just joined the meeting and listen, I was in the corner looked like I was in like the naughty seat, but I wasn't. It was like, and I was watching all these CEOs or because they're, they're mm. actually doing the awards for the event. And I'm like, wow, like listening from different perspectives and 
I was literally just, just learning from these people, more body language, um, yeah. how they spoke, um, how they, um, you know, just all industry stuff that, yeah. you know, I was sitting in the room going, I'm the luckiest person in this room because there's a load of students who may study sport, but they're not in the room where pieces of work in the industry are being judged on. And uh, I, I, I actually still got a few of my notes I still go back to on that. More just nothing of the awards itself, just more the processes and how they, what was, how was one more, how was one company's campaign was better than somebody else's. Just right. those little things. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but it was only the final few weeks I got sort of kind of got the news that I'd only be there another two more weeks. Mm -hmm. And I just remembered, kind of, you know, because I was speaking back to Durham, going, look, I'm yeah. part of this company. Have you heard of them? No. You haven't heard of Benchmark mm. International? No. Okay. Have you heard of Nick Keller? No. I was like, and I'm going, because I wanted to get John Amici to Durham. He, he He's an academic himself. He's a mm. psychologist. Not just that he's, you know, um, Great Britain's number one NBA player, you know, yeah. who's made it to the height um, at that time. And it didn't work out, but I thought, there was just this light bulb moment going, hold on this bit of that disconnect of, you know, industry with the academic world. Like, so, you know, and I was thinking, well, how am I going to do this? But also I wanted a resource where I could learn more because right. this is so true. But at the time there wasn't many blogs. LinkedIn mm. wasn't where LinkedIn is where it yeah. is today as even as a whole platform. And I'm going to be really honest. It was very hard to find credible information too. Right. This is really important one about share. You know, you've got to realize there's this dark side in the sports industry um, where people say what they do, but there's no credibility to back it up. And mm. it sounds harsh how I say it, but this is a huge important factor in today's society right. is that credibility. Um, it's not about how many followers you have or how many you have in your networks, it's the credibility you have in the industry. Yeah. And at that time, I only knew a handful myself um who have helped my journey who i could go to and go actually they they've walked the walk not to right. talk you know so mm. i remember i sort of pitched it to ollie who who i was basically his pa um yeah. i was one who was doing leads and i'm actually going to share this story because this is important when i was at benchmark i got it because ollie worked at soccer x and ollie was behind me at soccer x and i enjoyed mm. work with him because my job it's really simple it's not fun but it had to do it i had to find leads for their event sponsors mm. and um and i there was a guy called patrick cannon we were both like a tag team and then we would filter the leads to the certain department so we we were like the researchers and then we would give them the phone numbers and the names to the sales team but authentically done like we we warmed yeah. them up and if it worked out great business great but when i was when ollie moved i saw him it was a benchmark i reached out going look i'm just looking for a work experience i'm not gonna lie to you. i was desperate i was getting picked up by the recruitment industry not my cup of tea that's another story but we won't go there but my point is i was just like most people that just want to get in the game yeah. and i said i said to ollie look i'll pay to get in that room and pay my i said i just need more it just shows i need more work experience and this is what i'm going to say to people because there's so much different perspectives of internship volunteering like yeah. if you want to do something and you want it bad enough at the beginning you may just have to roll up your sleeves mm. and go the extra mile and go and i will pay not my like, like not paying to be there but pay my travel and expenses mm. and i just remember he said ed what can you do for me mm. i said ollie <clears throat> I'll do exactly the same what I did at Soccer X for you, but a lot more. I mean, a lot more leads. Yeah. And he goes, look, come on Friday. I was in my suit. I looked like, I looked like a lawyer, my friend. I <laughs> went, you know, most people in the sports industry do not dress in suits. You know, I yeah. had overcoat, tart. I looked like, I looked smart. And I mean, <clears throat> even people thought I was maybe a young lawyer coming in the room. <laughs> but, you know, you know, fresh face. But I was yeah. that serious. And we sat down. And he said, you know, I said, this is what I can do for you. And he said, look, you know, we, you know, basically we had a little negotiation. I said, look, all I appreciate is my travel mm -hmm. and a bit of, a bit like it was basically my travel and a bit of like lunch money, literally. Um, <clears throat> it was like 200 pounds a month. That was probably mm -hmm. it, which covered. And I was like, that's perfect. I was like, you know, so, so just when you're in the room, everybody, and you got a chance, don't 
go big with your negotiations but the travel was a huge one because london yeah. commute it isn't um cheap and you've got to be unmindful of that so mm. can we dig deep on this because so so many because i like internships should we get paid but mm. i'm like no i'm getting what am i getting out of it as an intern one experience which was my priority number one mm-hmm. number two i'm seeing how a work, work office environment works number mm. two you don't get that when you're at home and this was the time pre-covid and all that but you're not going to get it sitting at home looking mm. and the third thing was pretty pretty top of all of it but third thing i didn't realize looking back was the people the network and the yeah. people you meet along the way okay so um network's probably the wrong word but being exposed to people in the industry is probably a better term and Absolutely. um i literally you know with 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 ollie working with ollie i was um the final week where i went because I was so grateful for Ollie. Um, mm. I really, I can't express how grateful I was for this chance or this opportunity. I had my spreadsheet open. Mm. I said, uh, do you want to see how many leads I got you these three months? <laughs> 864. Whoa. That's how, that's plus making cups of tea. That's yeah. plus getting packs of paper. That's plus helping other departments out. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and because he sort of said, you know, he sort of said, apply weight. I had, you know you needed to go because you deserved or you know like a full time and i said i get it but company you gotta understand how companies work it was near april i left near april and what's april april web, and i know this myself being in business mm. do your company books so you know you've got to be mindful of how things so i had yeah. to, but till this day i respect i didn't had a great chat with nick really appreciated his time and his support mm. plus there was a little connection he went to durham as well so i mm. think that was another bonus Once, that yeah. you know that he went to durham he went to i think he was at in a college in the mm. um you know we had we had durham and for should we say but <laughs> my point is this is where you're creating a connection point ollie right because i worked with him and nick who never heard of me mm. went to durham you know sometimes it's simple as that and can i just say this i'm being so truthful there was no cv mm. no cover letter it was due to the relationship I had with Ollie. All of my experiences mm-hmm. really have been through the relationship approach. Uh, shall we, shall, I'll call it that. Uh, I'm not saying I'm not against CV cover letters because that's mm-hmm. not fair to say, but through my experiences, everything I've experienced, through, through, it's been through the network approach no. and then those conversations. I want to clarify that because if people are thinking, how this, how that, it's all through the people I've met and mm-hmm. building you know rapport with them over a period of time so but then i realized anyway i'm gonna speed this up but when when i was walking back from byflet newhall station i'm going ahead you can do this now you've you've experienced being a student you've experienced doing sports science degree you've experienced enough and i'm including a boxing thesis by the way you know Mm. that was a six-month project when i accumulated with all my internships it was near a year you know, from yeah. different environments in the sports industry, you could provide a resource to, and I didn't know how, but I just knew I could be the solution of providing a resource where people can learn from today. Like my goal to this day, and I said this to myself, I, I self-talk. It was mm. a good excuse to say I talked to myself, by the way, but yeah. it actually helps. Um, the goal was to provide a resource that one educates people about the sports industry because it's such a big growing ecosystem. Yeah. You're never going to perfect, perfect it, but there could always be improved knowledge on it. Um, the second one is the roles. Oh my goodness. When I was at all those internships and boxing thesis, I saw the roles in action. And then the third one was the people I wanted to learn from today's practitioners or people who have stepped in that career role. And now that that's still the same three objectives seven, mm. seven years ago outside that train station. So I moved up the country because mm. I'll be honest, Tasha, starting a business in Surrey or London is expensive. Expensive. I moved up with rates. I think I could get a broom cupboard in the Gherkin, by the way. That's probably it. Um, you know, there's no way I was going to have an office in London. No yeah. way with the uh, fees. Uh, I did actually look up in the girl. I was just curious because I had to do like, uh, oh, my gosh. Um, so joke aside, I moved up. I paid, I'll never forget, I paid my £15 domain, education2sport.com, and my register's about, I think, like £40, something like that. Mm. 
And I'm like, oh my gosh, this is real. Like, yeah, this is <laughs> set up this company is real. Education Sport Limited, that's the company name. Yeah. And uh, I still had no idea how to create this resource. Absolutely mm. no. Like, I read business books. Um, I had a, I had about, um, so I'm put, doing a bit of a timeline. Three months figuring out. Like I was lucky enough mm. to like stay at home, so I had a bit of you know. While people are doing summer holidays and stuff, no, I was. You know, I, have, I haven't had many holidays, by the way. But I'm saying, or well, people partying or whatever. I was figuring out how this is all going to work out. Right. So I always remember my mum saying this. I share this story. I'm never embarrassed because it's so true. She said, "Look, find something inspirational." And I went. So I went on my laptop. For some reason, I went on iTunes. I barely use iTunes, but this is when Spotify, where you only yeah. got 20 hours for free. So I signed up. I don't know if you know Spotify, but Spotify at the time was still really young. And mm. I only had 20 hours. That was the first wave. They had mm. waves of people join their platform, and you only had a period of time. And then it's not what it is today, everybody. That's what I'm going to say. Um, so I used iTunes more than I did. Um, mm. I came across podcasts. I clicked on that podcast tab on iTunes. I go, wow, what's all this? So yeah. I kid you not, I saw EO Fire uh, podcast, yeah. uh, which is John Lee Dumas, um, Entrepreneur on Fire. And I, I just went, look, I've got the book over there, actually, but School of Greatness. So I went, Lewis Howes, clicked on it. I went, this is amazing. I amazing. said, I like, this is when Lewis Howes just launched his first book. Hmm. So, and he said, join my newsletter. So Tasha, eight hours later, looked at a different show. There's actually one in Australia called the Sales Podcast with mm. a really awkward, like, cool name, but it's like Glenn Smythe, something like that. And I loved his format. He only done 34 mm. podcasts, but he had some amazing people. But his format was bang on. Mm. And afterwards, Tasha went, that's it. Got to be a podcaster. <laughs> and I literally said to myself, from a year from now, this is what I do with all my goals. From a year now, I'm going to be this. Mm. So this could be a goal. But for me, I'm going to call myself a podcast. But from that period, you're not a podcaster yet. You know, it sounds crazy, but, and you're yeah. doing great work. And I, and I really applaud you right at the beginning. But a lot of people call themselves a podcaster without yeah. doing the reps. And I'm not here, you know, but I'm a big believer. When you do it over a year, yeah. then I will, you can give yourself that lovely badge of podcaster. Yeah. That's just me as an individual. But it, it was important because I know people now just have podcasts and have done like, handful and i'm like mm, okay um so that that's me as a person this is because mm. i've done the reps maybe but and things are a bit different but back then podcasts you know this is 2015 mm. podcasts were around from 2007 i did my history of podcasts i was just curious but you know realistically it shot off in 2017 18 like let me be clear like that's when because mm. um to go back to my story i listened to eight i went right i'm gonna be a podcast so i found as much as i could and there was very limited resources by the way it's a lot yeah. easier to start a podcast now than it was back then. Let me back tell you then. that for a fact. So I um I went right, I'm gonna do a podcast. So and I'm gonna do only interview, no individual. Mm. And uh that and it solved all those problems, didn't it? You know, number yeah. one, teach people about the industry, teach people about the roles, and I'll speak to people. It was like boom. Yeah. It was like the podcast was my answer. So I went, okay, next step, what equipment do I need? Next step, you know process of going live next step planning it formatting it and i thought Ooh, yeah. you know it gets all a bit open but i you just keep tabbing so the first thing i did was and i love this ten this i won't go through all my podcasts by the way mm. you'll fall asleep but the first three was with my uh lecturer uh dr martin roderick from durham with that in mm. person the second one was with my uh former headmaster ship lake called mm. Greg davis who was a rugby referee and headmaster fascinating story and then the third one was with john amici who i met at durham and um, um, benchmark international sorry he we actually walked in the office and i managed to reach out and he said yes then and asked him to be my mentor and that's another story in the stars but he had a fascinating i read his book and i was just blown away but one was in person one mm. was on the phone it was a phone interview so imagine somebody two people on a phone doing it yeah because uh, this was on skype uh, and then the, 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 the last one was like, uh, was just Skype video. So like a zoom experience, so all yeah. a different experience. I'm like, Oh my gosh, this is a, you know, you think it's going to be all simple. It isn't because you've got to work around the people and we're talking Skype, whereas a lot harder, a lot harder. Yeah. There, there's a good platform to be fair Skype, but at the time 
it, it wasn't as simply as sending like you oh, if you don't mind you, you send me a stream link. i click the link i'm here uh, yeah it wasn't like that with skype um they yeah. had to log into your account they were mm. to connect all this but looking back it just um i did about i would say 80 episodes where i had to explain to the guests what a podcast was it just wasn't yeah. podcast wasn't in our should we say habit yeah. of how we consume information let's keep things simple i don't want to over complicate the listener but <laughs> end of the day as i say i always said podcaster uh, a podcast is a digital folder that's online like i just kept because i always thought it was a radio show yeah so i don't know it's just a digital folder that's online where people can listen that's it mm. and um literally i as i said to you i started i got to episode 10 uh no that was i'll go back i did my first three and i can mm. do not a month i delayed it God, i'm so nervous Jez. so i went yeah. down to surrey met a real good mentor called chris Wright. i said chris i need a favor i said i need you to listen to these, this podcast or at least one of them just to you know i'm nervous sharing this and he didn't know so we sat down in his sitting room and we put it on had a cup of tea he was, yeah. he was i heard him laugh i heard him chuckle i heard him go you know be, and he, he's a business person right and he goes ed this is really good and i go okay explain you know it's all well really good i, I need feedback please and if anything mm. more constructive feedback than praises and he says no ed, this is good but i go okay what's this but you got to do at least one a week. I thought, one a week? I went, you're kidding me. <laughs> <laughs> I literally had, I didn't, no, that was the answer he gave me. I went, yeah. Okay. Uh, so year one, I'll, I'll, I'll speed it up. I went, right. He gave me the feedback. Got what we want to eat. Year one, I'll be really honest. I was one every two weeks. Mm. Um, I did one a week and then I'll go, oh, I'll sneak it for next week. We'll have a week, you know, a week break, you know, mm. and it's not good habit. You're cutting corners. So yeah. 2016 to 2017 drawn a line go no ed you won a week you just got to yeah. figure it out and um literally hmm. story very very short now 26 uh so, like sort of 17 till this day um i have it mr tuesday um yeah. i and my show goes from january to november because i learned in hmm. the first two years i was having it during december yeah and i said nobody wants to listen to me or especially on christmas day yeah <laughs> that period of the year i want people to I could do other pieces of content during that time, but not interviews. Um, mm -hmm. And I take a month off, and I think I deserve a month off. Like I'm having, if you don't mind my time period, I'm having my, I finished my show last week. <laughs> yeah. And I, I have about six weeks off for the next season. Um, so, but, but jokes aside, going back to that art story, mm -hmm. you know, every weekend, I was in those, every weekend for six hours, except my 18th birthday weekend, <laughs> which was great fun, by the way. But, yeah. you know, it, that that story that mm. life experience even better helped me solve the problem with the weak podcast it's right. just, I, different i wasn't in an art room i was in mm -hmm. a, my little like office figuring out how to do one a week and it, it is easier than people think if you just think right. ahead have the right planning but the goal of the show was to have uh diversity yeah quality it's not just about helping people get jobs in sport. I want it to be a resource where you get different perspectives around the world. And that's the thing that mm. we're going to go talking to podcaster to podcaster. Yeah. The one thing I didn't realize back then of, and this is why all the big media companies have podcasts, is the reach. I just had no yeah. idea. And it makes me laugh when people say, oh, they had everything figured out. I said, no, it was completely opposite. And, yeah. you, know, um, you know, for me, it's been a journey and um and, and absolutely i love i just love getting on the mic i said even now how i speak to you i'm like a different human being um yeah. just because i'm just passionate about what podcast mm. does yeah. it's not just um of a medium of communication it actually can solve a lot of problems for people worldwide who and i didn't realize that this you know we talk, when we talked earlier about degrees internships mm. not every country provides that whole infrastructure of degree right. jobs mm. you know volunteer you know all that i mean i'm talking worldwide here just don't have that so we say ecosystem of education so podcasts can solve that solution i said to be all you need is the internet not, yeah. not everybody's on the internet yet but they will be very very shortly um that's the only investment you have to invest in to listen to us to today now 
I'm not going to say I can solve all your career problems, but hopefully mm. with some of the examples and case studies could point you in the right direction. Like don't, you know, I'm a mm. big advocate of YouTube that has, it's a great platform too, and you can learn a lot. But, you know, what I'm trying to say here is back when I started, there was none of these sort of resources. Yes, YouTube was around. The only best story was Justin Bieber was the only pop star who used YouTube yeah. as their leverage. Mm -hmm. That mm. was the only example, but you went from one extreme, but then you've, We've got all the other people who are great content creators. So mm. for me, podcasting is a lifestyle. It will, you know, even when, you know, I always go back to parents because I, I honestly, I cannot respect them enough. But mm. even mum said, you're never going to quit the podcast. I said, no, never. But, the, but like anything, there is a time when, like me, you have to have a break because you, it shows you've got to appreciate what you do. So yeah. really, story short, I, I've been doing podcasting for seven years now, interviewed over 300 people in the sports industry, mm -hmm. different sectors. Um, at the same time, I've worked on different projects, worked with some great clients in the sports industry too, which has been a byproduct through the podcast. Mm. Um, and yeah, I'm just at this great place now where I'm planning on a few other projects, um, rebranding my podcast. It will yeah. be the same, but I'm just at a rebranding stage. Tasha, you mm -hmm. should have seen my podcast art from season one to where it is now. Oh my goodness. Uh, thank goodness for Canva, shall we say. Um, but, you know, not even Canva was around when I started. So mm -hmm. my point is, you know, it's been a real cool journey. Uh, but mm. I want to be really clear, like, there's like, there has been the down moments, everybody. I want to be really yeah. clear. There's periods where with my podcast, um, my website went down. Uh, I won't go into mm. this story, but I went, oh, my goodness. So, you know, for six weeks, I had mm. to rebuild the website, stop my whole podcast production uh, mm -hmm. because I was all scheduled and it, I, I ended up rebuilding my website. So I actually rebuild my websites now because um, I know what I'm doing. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it's just that. that so everything you see as a, I've created in different aspects, so my skill sets have improved as well. Uh, right. I'm not saying good at every aspect, uh, but I am a big believer when you understand StreamYard, for example, I'm going to say this because I use this tool. It's amazing. I did a summit yeah. um, two weeks after the global pandemic when everybody was in. And we did, yeah. we did, uh, Amy Wanda and I did 24 interviews in 24 hours. It was amazing. Mm. And we raised money for the COVID fund, like global COVID mm -hmm. fund. Um, but if you understand the tools, like nobody knew what StreamYard was at the time. We just, yeah. I, we, like, like my podcasting, I had to figure it, we had to figure it out, but I had to figure it out because I, I was running on my computer. Mm. Um, so don't, what I'm trying to say is, Tasha, to your listeners, you don't have to be this polished, perfect version. Right. You know, you've got to be the polished, progressive person, meaning building momentum in what you want to do. I'm all about progression than perfection. Mm -hmm. So um, I just want to be clear to listeners, when I say seven years, don't think seven years of, you know, straight line. Uh -uh. It, you know, there were bumps along the way, but yeah. certainly built my character and certainly built my courage at the same time. So I said quite a lot there, Tasha, but I'll give you the mic uh, back now. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I think you go um the first question, which I have, and you completely uh, talk about how your journey started. And yeah, it's completely because you see, especially in the sports industry. Uh, yeah. The first thing is foremost thing is there's a lack of uh, content in terms of the people who really want to work in it. And when I started, so I played the cricket at the very young age and my hero was Sachin Tendulkar at that time. He was everything to me. And he was the person that he made me love towards the sports industry. He was the first person. And then I had not to know about it. The people, not only in cricket, there was hockey also. And I, luckily I met Dhanraj Pillai, the Indian hockey legend. Uh, so I have this, uh, so I have this. I see in the right background. Here. Wow. Yeah, so, so this year only, I, uh, in November, 4th of November, we have symposium in Bangalore. So I went there and luckily Dhanraj Pillai was there. So I met him. I shake, uh, shake, uh, shake his hand. I was shaking at that time because uh, because I saw his game, I think in 2004, he played his last game against Pakistan. And India's Pakistan have that that yeah, quite history, privately yeah, at that time. Yeah, so, so, that so that's why I met him. I told him that uh, I watched your 2004 game and I really loved that game. And he was quite emotional at that time. If you watch that game, I think I still have that clip in the YouTube. And I saw that completely made me love towards the sports. You have so much emotion. You are... Uh, 
stick to the tv at that time and at that time we don't have we have that the crt monitors that uh, that run on the crt tubes so yeah and that's why the journey started for me from that time yeah it's been i got a really bad injury in my finger so yeah i can't uh, so i can't grip my ball so that's why i have to left the cricket at that time in i think uh, in 20 uh, 13 i left the mm-hmm. cricket at that time so i'm exploring my journey we have to go so my father was very inclined to push me into the chartered accountancy but I said no i can't do it i can't study yeah. so much books yeah. and then uh, he was not ready, ready to i will send you for the bbs so i just went to the course called bb llb it's a five year course so you will get the aspects of the business aspects also because i am very inclined in the human resource management and yes. then i also get to know what the how the legal aspect work so for the first two years i was quite struggling in the law school so i went to this mass law school pune uh, one of the top 10 law schools of india so i went there first two years i was quite struggling and then gradually i have to understand that it doesn't work like what i have that uh, process to work in school time so i have to change my strategy how i have to work on that so i have to do the deeper research on the certain topics on certain subjects and then my i have that turn around i think from 2017 when i just went into my third year of law school because in india we have five year of law course so i went there and things getting turned up and that and that time uh, sports law just started at that point of time uh, in india and now we you see there are a lot of law firms right now in india so yeah journey started but right now i still i didn't do any sports law internship in my <laughs> st- from the from bbl lb honors to the llb i still didn't do it but still i'm working it because i have that passion i harness that skill from the last two years either doing just reading books working as a, a volunteer or getting to do this podcast where people come on but they share knowledge and that experience i apply in my real life situation i think i give the review of the stephanie genesis uh, podcast i post it yeah <laughs> well we, let, i'm going to flip the mic i'm going to nab <laughs> nab it off you like cuz i've interviewed a fair few sports lawyers yeah. and um you know i'm not a sports lawyer everybody so there's a little mm. disclaimer here but i i find you know if i'll be honest being a lawyer teaches so many great skills yeah. like something simple as um reviewing contracts um yeah. negotiating really and i say this with an emphasis of really representing mm. your clients right so you've got to have that understanding of you know those soft skills mm. it's massive um like steph was a great one like talk about boxing oh my goodness that's how we yeah really got our conversation going online because of that similar interest and but going back to being a lawyer um when i've interviewed a fair few and i've actually interviewed one who did transition to esports mm mm-hmm. I do agree you do not need to start in sports law get just get rid of the 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 sport bit the top lawyers I've spoken to actually all of them because of the age they are at this is why yeah. it's a different generation the age I'm talking I'll say without you know rough it you know rough you know they're 35 plus years old or a bit older right. right so a lot of them you know if we go back 30 years from now where I was just about born a lot of sports yeah. were amateur there were right. many sports degrees in general let alone mm. sports law just degrees in general so how things were built look mark mccormack the founder of yeah. img was a lawyer transitioned into he loved he loved law he loved golf what did he do he represent the three top male golfers arnold palmer right. jack nicklaus and gary player oh my goodness in the world yeah. of male golf you couldn't pick the three oh they're like the michael jordans they're like yeah. you know the shrina williams like <laughs> in this like, at this time in male golf he represented right. them he used his legal skills and i'm mm. at just this huge animal in the sports industry it's actually the place i really wanted to work by the way when i started mm. but i didn't have the game plan but what's my point you know he used his legal skills and applied yeah. it into a sporting environment so going back to lawyers you know the one thing i learned is focus on your trade like um you can quote me right with the right terminology but i think a good one is like labor law like how employment mm. law is you know right. is the same transitional skills with uh player transfers it's at the end of the day right. they're getting hired by a club right so yeah. my point is i'm not even a law and i'm you know i'm testing myself here what i'm about <laughs> to say but if you understand the 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 legal principles uh and the regulations it's the regulations that's the toughest part of a lawyer because they're always yeah. updating yeah and it's really hard 
you know, if you're working on a certain case and the regulations change, that's where it gets all complicated. We won't go through that mm-hmm. can of worms, but you can see that I am I'm so curious of lawyers because one, their skill sets are transferable in different areas of Absolutely. not just business, but in sport mm-hmm. business, but also, you know, there, there, this is a debate here. We won't go through it, but so far what I have seen, mm-hmm. I have seen, but you do need the relationships with the clients, which is vital, clients. Yeah, which is vital. Um, because this is a point of view, I do believe the best agents I have met have that legal experience or knowledge behind them. Mm. Okay, because so, but we won't go through that whole conversation. What I'm saying is, if you study law, you mm. have you are you you've got a real foundation, not just being representing people. If you want to go that route, you actually get how things are done in business in yeah. general, like let's make things fun it could be a cat business it Mm. it could be a construction business the legal aspect really gives you the groundwork now it doesn't mean you're the greatest leader but it Mm. does mean you understand the behind the scenes of how things are done so you know for me tush i know you you know i'm super grateful with the feedback of steph's podcast but there's a pop you know when you shared that on instagram and i i did praise you and thank you in person that honestly Mm. When I start my podcast, that fulfills me more than a download. And this is right. really important about, about what I'm about to say here. A lot of people want to start podcast blogs, build a following for numbers. Mm. No, you, mm. you you want it to be um, a reason of fulfillment. Now, don't get me wrong. I want you to build your network. That is numbers. I do want you. That's important. But we're in a digital world now where we go on our phone. We're expecting fulfillment of a like. We're expecting no when I saw that message, I'm like, this is my vision for hmm. seven years. It's touch. You have no idea when you, you did a two story of the learning lessons of that podcast, right? Hmm. You have no idea how I sat back in my chair going, I solved it. Okay. <laughs> it's only one human being here, but you have no idea when I started, there was okay. no resource like it. And I'm not here trying to pat myself on the back. I'm just trying to explain to the listener that you can start a podcast within mm. six hours even that you know i want i like to be give people say oh you start one in 10 minutes no i would mm. say within six hours you could learn mm. how to run a podcast blog right write an article on linkedin within 40 minutes you know that the tools are there it's right. the attitude you know um i've got some books i do want to share because i think they'll be helpful because they're the first sort of books some yeah. of them the first books and some of the ones i go back to but i know it's one of your questions but my point is a lot of what I'm talking about is attitude. Right. You know, um, I think for me going back, mm-hmm. reflecting, when I had the right attitude, um, mm-hmm. things have gone right, uh, the right direction. I'm going to share a quote from my mom's partner, who was one of my first mentors in just getting me off the ground because he had run businesses. Like, if you know people who run businesses effectively, mm-hmm. um, you can still learn from them, by the way. they don't have to, You don't have to learn from a sports lawyer to be a sports lawyer. Mm. yes it's good to role model good practice of being a sports lawyer but you can get inspiration from other walks of life and he always said this quote when things are good around you Mm. it's funny how other things are good around you but when things are bad everything's bad around everything you look at everything it's always and it goes back to the attitude so you know if there are sports lawyers listening and i have got a few i want you to without a doubt listen to this podcast because you've got some amazing guests um because Tasha, you're you're solving a problem too um mm-hmm. we're getting the right people in the on the mic um and and sharing what it's like to be in their shoes so yeah i'm going to pass you back the mic but being a sports lawyer i have said to people in the industry if i went back in time and did mm-hmm. a degree i would certainly do modules on sports law because or, or, or law in general mm-hmm. not criminal law but um but you know, my point is you can learn a lot from that you know, right. I would say historic industry. It's one of those. It's like banking industry, law. The legal industry is very mm. old. It's got its. Um, there's even career pathways, which is a lot easier than sports law. If that I'm makes saying. sense. Mm-hmm. So, but without a doubt, final thing I'm going to say, and this is from you know a good friend, a mentor as well, Dev Kumar Palmer. He did say, Ed, it is about how you work with your clients. So right. you cannot forget that aspect. You could you could have the knowledge of being a great sports lawyer. But if you can't communicate that and build trust with the athletes or clubs mm. or representatives, it's going to be very challenging. So yeah. 
and that side is your networking skill. So I'm going to pass you back the mic, but <laughs> there's my uh, two cents of sports law, but not being a lawyer or sports lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, uh, next question. What are the sports which you still follow and who are your favorite athletes in both male and female? Oh, I did see this question. Do you know what's funny now? I, hmm. I really do enjoy watching all sports. Really quick example. Yeah. First time in history uh, with the um, World Cup of Rugby Leagues in the UK. Yeah. So they had uh, the Men Rugby League, they had the Women Rugby League, and then had Wheelchair Rugby Leagues. First time ever they did three different you know, disciplines of rugby league um, in one competition. Mm -hmm. And I watched some of the rugby wheelchair, which England won, and it was fascinating. And, you know, of course, we're talking while there's the Men's World Cup, Hmm. lucky enough to you know um being a tennis player i actually did lose love for tennis when i was actually in okay. university so but what what's the point i i actually just enjoy all sports golf looks okay. a big golf house here f1 hmm. so you've asked me a broad question do you know what i love more now hmm. if i'm being really honest because i have believed this now hmm. i believe there's a different perspective hmm. um when you're working in sport than being a sports fan so yeah everybody i've spoken to so what i love is uh how the industry influences sport yeah. okay like do not get me wrong you have no idea how excited to talk about cricket mm. when the england men's won the 2020 mm. bearing in mind they lost to ireland do you know how much stick i got from my island yeah. friends and they said hey apparently a good guy called duck and a good guy called lewis uh gave us the win <laughs> you know the douglas lewis uh, yeah I, I had so much fun uh, and these are rugby friends who mm. were like uh, true male rugby fans you know you yeah. don't realize the stick that we had going so really so realistically you're saying ireland are the second best team in the world <laughs> <laughs> you know um with the, was that that competition um but it's sport but Mm. Um, but if we go back to one sport in my mind, I, I, I honestly, till this day, talk about cricket. So that's a sport you're passionate about. When uh, England played New Zealand in the men's 50 over game, where Stokes literally. 2019 World Cup. Yeah, World Cup. That was yeah. some game. Yeah. Like, definitely. That, More... that, 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 like, the, and, and it, like, honestly, I, I watched cricket, played it, but that, that was vibes of the 2004 the, the, that that amazing ashes with yeah. austria men australia you know we're talking yeah. that era because I, I watched that that that's where i watched was, that game i still remember the 2004 ashes and, ashes uh, yeah yeah so i uh, i think uh i was too young i think seven years of age i was at that time yeah, yeah but that was but the, you know, the buzz was unbelievable like yeah we're talking, you know, Shane Warne, who's not around anymore. Yeah. Uh, Gil Chris. Um, that, 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 uh, to be honest, it's that Harmison bowled down the wicket. Steve Harmison. Jo and then Jones, ball. Jones, yeah. you know, this was, you know, you have, honestly, in this country, you have no idea how that brought the country together. You have yeah. just no idea. Like, the, that one, I've actually mm. got the um, wisdom book for that year. Oh, you have nice. No, like, yeah, I've got some wisdom books and I've got that one. It was a metal. Like, I had to get that one. And uh, so you asked me a question about sports. You know, for me, of course, I want to keep it on my fitness. I don't play as much because mm. you have no idea mm. of in the sports industry of, you know, the right. work you do. That's not trying to make an excuse. I want to play more tennis. You wouldn't believe I, I want to get back into it. Mm. Uh, but I did got introduced to paddle tennis which is my game without a doubt yeah. a better volley player um my net get skills are pretty good hmm. but my point is you know i think what i'm trying to say is touch is honestly i get more except those periods of a final or a great sports match i don't get the same buzz as i probably hmm. did when i watched sport i'll be really like for example, England play Wales, England play in men's World Cup, good game, one three nil. But yeah. do you know what gets me up? It's getting on this mic and speaking to somebody in the industry who's doing something to make the industry better. That's yeah. my like, or educating people in the sports industry. Right. That is what fires me up. Not mm. oh, Manchester United lost last mm. week. Do you know what? I've really or men's team. 
really not fast. Um, it sounds sounds like people think, and it's. I'm going to say this, and I have to mm. realize you don't have to be. You don't have to like sport to work in right. sport. I think we need to. I, I, I have to clear this up with people. Sometimes you really don't. I know people who I've had on my podcast who don't mm. like sport but love how their how their skill sets are improving in the sports industry. Right. So, but I think when you have that uh, understanding of sports, I don't mean understanding a sport industry sector. By the way, I mean just you know knowing the rules of football. You know, it doesn't really matter. But if you are a great event person on the day, making a great VIP experience for hospitality, that's what matters at the end yeah. of the day. So, going back to question, I'll like as I said to you, right from being as a young child, sport mm. taught me life lessons in different Definitely. sports. Mm. That's what I look at sport, even when I play, even when I. Luke, like it's funny i played um some paddle tennis in mm. portugal I'll give you this little case study because it's so true we did an event in portugal four days and and um thomas who's part of the uc girl council said oh, come on come with us play some tennis like, absolutely my, my flights flights later on in the afternoon i'm definitely playing paddle tennis and uh you know i haven't hadn't picked up a racket any racket for mm. a few years mm. but I, I i sort of did a game bit rusty i've got you know we got beat and i went okay you guys play i walked around mm. so what i did i used all my podcast knowledge people i've interviewed mm. and i started to watch all like the coaches because I, I i've been a tennis coach by the way so i mm. and you know sort of going back my old motor motor skills back then right. I'm like, okay i'm getting the old vibe it's totally different to tennis but i can mm. get where to stand where so i was just observing and yeah so while they were playing the game, I had a good walk around the club, mm -hmm. getting some mental notes, watched a, another game. Well, mm -hmm. like, okay. So anyway, I came on and he goes, what have you done? I did I did <laughs> some great volleys. And he goes, ah, just uh, walk around the place. And <laughs> do you know what I was really doing? I was using all the knowledge yeah. I've learned from Alistair McCaw. Um, you know, here's uh, Seven Ways to be a great coach. Or uh, I looked at people who, who've of you know certain clips they've said on a podcast during that walk mm. and i came on with a different attitude and actually the last three games we won like the, the three matches i stayed on the court because it was like a round robin there was a five yeah. of us so one of us had to step off the court and it was my turn so and i did some some pretty good shots even some squash shots which mm. you, the ball can hit the back of the wall if it's right. in play and you can hit back and he goes head like you know that's a really good way i was like yeah no just got that from over there <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but i'm just trying learning isn't something mm. where you need a pen paper and a workbook uh -uh. learning is how you adapt in the environment you're in right. and how you apply it application learning i call mm. it that's what real learning is you get inspired by somewhere and then you've got to try it out it may fail a couple of times like it did at mm. playing paddle tennis but then when you know what works stick with it and move on like to the next challenge ahead um right. so you know, for me, Tasha, this is a really good point. I do want to play more sport, but I kid you mm. not, you know this now because, like you said, you've just right. started. Time is the most yeah. important asset. And, you know, I used to play a lot of golf, by the way. Mm. And, you know, an average golf is three hours and a half. Mm. But I kid you mm. not, when you play with some players, it could be four hours and a half. And that's four you know, hours. That's, you end up being mm. a whole day. And mm -hmm. um, I'm going, I can't really <laughs> play around a golf every weekend. It's a whole yeah. day lost. Where I could oh, use that four hours for, um, mm. you know, meditating. Not all four hours, but parts of it could be a run, meditating, yeah. health. You know, all this stuff that I'm learning. Energy. My my word. Just but I've sort of done my goals already for this for next year. But my word for next year is energy, and everything I look at is like how I show up with the energy right. on this podcast. Energy of when I do a certain task because mm -hmm. if you don't have the energy. Um, could be nutrition that's why i love one word a year to focus on because how you apply it in different ways this year was discipline and mm. my goodness killed it apps with that word well now i don't i think you did nicely like it but oh you actually nicely commented this year's seasonal podcasts mm. um not here to praise myself but i'm just saying this year i've done uh 62 podcasts and then whoa two <laughs> two events did a virtual summit at the beginning of the year. Yeah. Um, I'm just thinking other. Oh, uh, yeah. One, one. Well, uh, as you know, I'm working with one client where we're launching a book in March. So I've been, I wouldn't say co-author. That's wrong. But I've helped 
this person okay. called Lee McDermott mm-hmm. with his book. He's a sort of Olympian and two-time British uh, uh, champion, English champion and Commonwealth Games gold medalist mm. um, writing his book. You know, so we've been every week building this. And we've written the book now and we're, we're about to promote it in March. So, you know, all these different projects. Um, and I look back going, mm. oh, there's, there's discipline in here. There's bits of, I'll be honest, mm. there's times I had it about three weeks ago where I need a real break. Yeah. Um, my uh, my brain, my energy was low, like just because body was just fatigued but yeah and that's taught me a lesson but seriously like um as a little tip for people pick a word uh you know it could be i always find motivation inspiration not the right words it's got to be mm. a word that creates action you know you can't right. be motivated 24 hours a day but energy mm. you, you can discipline you can because discipline what did i do every day got it here my pad and paper and i and mm. i the simple thing my discipline i always schedule my week and day things do yeah. change because of time like with certain, when i edit a podcast it may take longer than the time i set myself on my yeah. diary but um that's where the discipline kicks in and then you've got mm. morning routines and stuff like that but there's enough information on that touch but <laughs> the point is that's that's what i'm all about it's pick a word pick your goals pick a word um mm. and it's that's what's worked for me so I know it's a bit of a long-winded question. So, yes, I do play sport. I want to play more sport. But yeah. um, for me, as I said, I'll finish up this point. You know, I get more fulfillment uh, interviewing people in the sports industry because this is what I love doing. So, yeah, mm. Mike's back to you, my friend. Yeah. So because, you are absolutely right because right now for us who are right now working as a professionally, time is something that we have to manage it. And even even i it's been uh, i think two years i didn't pick up a bat i didn't pick up the cricket bat and uh because f- most of my friends either they are working uh in any government office or in a private job or they are in the other cities so it's really difficult to not to play cricket <laughs> because cricket is something you cannot play individually mm-hmm. else we can play the backyard cricket right here yes but still this is something which i cannot do individually so i have to virtually right now so yes. that's the thing so yeah next one next question so uh you know right now before world cup is happening in qatar your thoughts on it because there's so many things happen because right now there's a one documentary released by the netflix fifa uncovered and we see i haven't now. watched it but okay oh this is i saw this question i'm like oh my goodness right we both will put our thoughts no no we'll things. put it on it's it's fine it's it's very interesting um mm. got to realize to be correct yes it is the right year uh you know it's 10 years from the 2012 yeah olympics right this, this is my answer to it you'll realize that 2012 olympics had a great legacy you know really brought people together it certainly mm. inspired me and you know i always think of the olympics the pinnacle event and then underneath the men's football world cup i hope the women's you right. know the euros right. was amazing but at, mm. we were talking historically Absolutely. over a period of time that the men's mm. well football world cup has been one of those mega events that have brought literally right. countries mm-hmm. together to to watch the sport and even through my studies it was mm. still the high this you know the second highest global viewed event in person or or certainly on television rights so mm. that's it's all backed up there but can i just say on a side note the women's euros was amazing in this country i actually went mm. watched loved the experience but going back to qatar it's really interesting um it's actually been interesting in our house so let's just keep things real my mom's partner has no interest in it mm. not because he's a west ham fan mm. uh, born and bred you know these are the days of uh, west ham millwall days yeah. <laughs> which we talk about passion oh my goodness mm. you look some games on youtube you know you know yeah. the fans and the players it's it's a big rivalry i would almost say to a point bigger than maybe everton liverpool to a point more mm. just the rivalry aspect because we're talking towns of london yeah most opposite streets so going back to the point he's not because it to be to keep things simple and again this could be a whole podcast in itself it's what the the hard thing is is what the tournament is representing right now um human rights perspective right work person perspective of the stadiums um story a side story i actually had family in qatar 
Mm. um back in i think 2009 i went out there in 2011 so this is before Qatar, where it is now as a whole nation this is um and it's a beautiful country i love i actually love my time going to Qatar. Uh, i Mm. really really did and i actually the people are amazing i love let me just be clear i actually loved like um the the sort of way they live but in a way that um how you were treated as a tourist you know you right. felt welcomed but 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 we were there when stadiums were being built not just for the world cup but for other stadiums for the sporting mm. events and i'm going to be really honest tasha it wasn't these people didn't even have crash helmets you know and i don't oh. want to go through this whole direction but when i was reading reports of members of the workforce dying mm. um due to incidents you know i've seen it yeah. and my father has been in the police for 30 years and mm. you know police has a pro you know uk police have a protocol of health and safety whatever operation right. they have so i don't know this can of words but because i've experienced it see it mm. you know when i saw that and i was these these studies well these stories were happening when i was studying at durham and actually yeah at durham i've seen it firsthand not the death just the the environment working environment so and i i have no um uh, if we're going from my perspective of qatar they are wonderful stations what i'm seeing but it's not difficult to respect the, yeah. the work people you know so that's mm-hmm. one part there's one but that's my this is my perspective but Pete's right. perspective is more the politics the human rights and it's just amazing how it's there's like this better it's like a bitter taste in the mouth right you know um which is a shame because we're forgetting about the mm. great football you know mm. and and the countries you know look at wales you have no idea uh how much hard work they had to get to the world cup like wales right. is such a tiny country very mm. much part of the united kingdom and scotland you know it's really if, if what i'm trying to say if you if it was uk going to um the world cup mm. um we want to talk about player selection so i'm just trying to say you know uk as a whole is smaller than a heck of a lot of countries right. than the african countries um you know all the other bigger nations like canada australia you know so by us uk splitting into scotland england wales it means it's harder if there wasn't right. the english league mm. um mm. Is a, as a as a product right we would be like smaller leagues in europe like the dutch or the do you know what i'm trying to say like the great leagues, right. but no like premier league so What's the point mm. here? When Wales didn't have a great tournament, you have just no idea how hard it is to get there. So you're getting me about Qatar. We should not turn like should not forget why we're there. And yeah. that is for the game itself. Mm. It's the football and what it represents, uh, the history. Like, I I don't know about you, but I love seeing all the the past well men's world cup highlights. Right. Um, you gotta realise my 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 biggest highlight because it's my era was david beckham that free kick against greece yeah you have no idea against greece yeah i i I remember that like that i watched that you know you just have not and that's okay it wasn't at the world cup but it it, it's that journey to the world cup you know that's what i'm saying so look qatar you would like anything and this is where it's great debates in the house is you know if i went to your home right now going tasha Mm. you can't make your bed like that you can't have your podcast like that because in england we do that or you know you sort of go hold on a minute this is you know yeah so i'm keeping it simple like you your home has Mm. your way of living uh with integrity and values right my home has integrity and values but may do things differently um so i'm keeping things simple you know it's a simple way of your catalog but unfortunately there's you've got to look at two sides of the coin you've got people going to Qatar saying you should change this 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 and it's not like Qatar going, well, you should do this, this, this in mm-hmm. your country. It, you know, that's, that right. is why it's this bitter taste. Um, it's mm-hmm. the communication. Now, um, people have had in the industry, mm-hmm. it's not about them changing. It's just adjusting certain, mm-hmm. like my adjustment is get a bundle of crash helmets. That's mm-hmm. nothing about culture. That's about human. Basic necessity. Yeah, exactly. Like, can you get my point? Like, like getting a bunch of security no, not security, mm-hmm. like crash helmets and self and health and safety areas water zones mm-hmm. you have no idea with the sandstorms they have out there yeah you know it makes it makes a, a, a heavy wind in the uk see nothing and it was i'm not joking my, my father said to me a couple of days ago we saw a guy 
brushing the floor because he had to be out there working in a sandstorm. So what every brush, it was just going under his blooming brush. It was pointless. And yeah. we're talking a, a really, you know, it's very hot out there, extremely hot. So my point is he shouldn't have been doing it. But if he didn't do it, he wouldn't get paid. And blah, 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 blah. You know, so this is nothing about culture. This is about, mm. you know, a bit of common sense. So hopefully I've managed to answer the question two different perspectives. But one yeah. is you can't go to somebody's country and dictate how they should yeah. adjust their living. But there is the other side where it comes to human necessities of like uh, health or rights, mm -hmm. we say, you know, so, so with regards to the tournament, I've loved it as a football fan. You have no idea yeah. how much joy it's been having four games a day, yeah. having purpose. It's been amazing. But with regards to the tournament itself, it's almost like things off the pitch have been more of a priority on the pitch. And let's be honest, every World Cup, Olympics, there's always something of a campaign that goes on behind every tournament. Mm -hmm. Give you an example of the Euros, just to, women's Euros. So, right. just don't think it's just this men's World Cup, okay? mm -hmm. but the women's Euros, you know, after when the English team, like the English team did amazing, not just for English football, but football in general, because do you know what they did afterwards, mm -hmm. 24 hours? They mm -hmm. did a signed letter to the government to get every school right. in the UK mm -hmm. to play football for girls. That's you're using sports politics. So let's get things real right. clear. It's not just this men's world cup where politics involved every, because there's eyeballs, there's attention, there's attraction. There's always going to be some sort of political aspect for good. You hope to, to improve society. You can right. look at loads of them. It's not, I've given you one that was brilliant with women's football and you have no idea how refreshing and powerful that was. Uh, yeah. Because when I was brought up, I played rugby um mm. i actually had a woman uh, i'm gonna say girl because we were boys and girls at that age but you know alice was playing rugby and my goodness she could tackle like but was mm. there a pathway for women's rugby at the time no not uh 20 years ago so and same sorry england were in uh the world cup women's final against new zealand you have no idea mm. when those women played, inspired people um in the uk too so it's you know but let me be clear again every global tournament this is what mm. i love why I did my degree at Durham, there's always some sort of social campaign to improve mm. society. It's just business and it's mm. a way of, you know, hopefully improving um, an influence. But unfortunately, like with any campaign, you're going to get the negative aspect of whatever that negative aspect is. So, so this is my Ed, the research head on, <laughs> hat on, but going back to Qatar, I'm trying to just focus on the football at this period mm. of time. And I hope maybe afterwards, a bit like 2012, that's why I mentioned this example, okay. is it creates a positive legacy. So I'll give you one positive legacy, which I did not know about. Bearing in mind, I would never call ourselves a beach ball nation, um, yeah. you know, with regards to like um, beach ball on the beach. I didn't really realize all that sand during the whole of the the Summer Olympics were turned mm. into beach beach volleyball courts around the whole country oh. i went how cool is that? how simple is that it's just public public i didn't realize i went past one uh when i went down south I said, what's this and it, it was part of the legacy mm. okay i met the swimming pools you know the swimming pools didn't work out because the whole point with the uh 2012 was sort of more reduced rates on swimming pools see i'm going depth and policy here but one of the policy legacies was um after the event after 2012 everybody can have access to more like instead of paying seven pounds to go to the swim pool you can pay three because okay. all the resources you know it's just trying to recycle resources but the beach the uh beach ball summer courts have been such mm -hmm. a huge success there's been increased people just playing beach ball on the beach number one mm. but also playing actual games on these beach ball courts so and not many people know about that so yeah. um what i'm saying with qatar is i hope afterwards there are great legacy, mm. you know, applied afterwards. And but that's not them because they've dictated how to change a whole culture because nobody wants to come in the UK and change our culture. And I would say in the same, I assume in India, nobody wants to be um, forced to change how traditions mm. have been. So there's my answer. But all I will say, short note, the football's been brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, because you see, uh, because I also make a one post on that, that uh, whenever you watch this. Uh, 
harsh weather and what are things that they have to go on by their family members because especially the laborers which are migrant laborers are from india nepal mm-hmm. um african nations and other nations from there and what are the things that they have to face it at that time but still there are such some of the cultural differences also if we talk about the um usually in uh, uh, middle east countries there so certain cultural differences can be which can be sorted out but yeah also as a fan we have to respect certain cultures because uh, because such global events which are happening right now uh, in around the globe because india is also preparing to bid for the one of the fifa world cup i think yeah. after 2040 because they are preparing for it even for the olympics also and i did a one uh, because the previous to this episode i was talking to roshan so the next episode with him and he talk about the how if if countries are not ready to uh, uh provide such kind of infrastructure don't bid for such kind of global event if you are not prepared fully so first focus on the grassroots level develop certain sports program and then if your country is ready then go for it yeah and that's the only thing that you can develop the sports at a global level so we talk about that yeah So moving on to the next question you see that the what is the future of the sports and recently in olympics four sports events has been added one is the breaking which is break dance second is surfing third is wall climbing and fourth is the skateboarding and uh, what challenges can be uh, for such events because they are the certain events in olympics also like uh, wrestling weightlifting boxing right because mm-hmm. olympic uh, international olympic Com- association they were planning to scrap such events i don't know why because maybe they because of the viewership of the certain event that can be one of the major aspect but still yeah this side is not you know as much as i find the olympic movement fascinating but you're right every even commonwealth games they add new sports hmm. um and it depends on the host nation as well Um I looked at that list when you showed me that question for me if you know if you define the word sport it means activity right and if you put the olympics in there olympic sport it's really the you know the pinnacle of the sport you know or the Absolutely. pinnacle competition mm. and I don't know if you people have seen speed wall climbing ha huh. mm. my goodness they're fit people I mean with their right. fitness levels and I mean the psychology of racing up a rock wall is unbelievable honestly the, the the speeds that's a sport mm. what's the difference between a 100 meter sprint on a on a track to going up a wall mm. could be wrong but i think you're using more muscles um mm. and i i'm not I'm no climber by the way uh did when i was a child and i was useless i did manage mm. to get up but it's hard work i did actually this year do some gorge walking which some of it was in the rock climbing thing and my goodness it was hard enough doing a couple yeah. let alone So I think what my point is any sport can be a sport when it has that competition hmm. component in and it's funny we always had debates <laughs> when I was a child cuz story short I won't go in this but I'm at one thing I'm famous for in my Durham college was I'm actually the first president of the darts team uh for two years the fa- I'm the founder of not the founder but I was the first sort of founding group and I was the first mm. president and I started playing darts I I sort of because I lost love of tennis I went right I'm going to do sports a bit different I I played pool when I was younger so I played pool mm. for a pool team but darts was fascinating story really short my friend was playing it and he looked really tired I'm like I said John why you so just ah oh, played a game of darts last night I went mm. and I I just had I was like darts and I got involved and I've got good hand coordination and um you know i we end up watching phil taylor i've watched phil taylor live sorry mm. you know, phil taylor he is england's greatest darts player of all time he's 16 world champion like that mm. eric bristow who was his mentor um right. and he had four i think three or four mm. you know 16s a lot it's it's like um put this in in tennis worlds it's like winning 16 wimbledon titles you know it's the pinnacle of that sport in got uh, he ended up being third in sports personality of the year dart player mm. it's unbelievable what's my point here i've had comp- people going well dart players are big you know they sort of stereotype this is my point probably mm. a lot of people stereotype a sport let's go with the skateboarding one skateboarding is a sport 
because they're stereotyping. But if you see what Tony Hawk's does, this is my mm. generation of playing the games. And right. the, 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 the skill level. Like I'd say, mm. you know, how you define a sport, it comes down to the activity itself, mm. the skill level itself, and then the competition itself of elitism. That mm. if it comp- if it does those components, mm. it's a sport. Like it's funny. I, there was a great documentary um, of chess. Wow, the mindset skill and the mm. strategy, unbelievable. Mm. Like if you look at the top uh, male or and female generals, where's the inspiration from? Chess. Chess. Majority of them. When I spoke to Owen Bulcher, his top boxers, he taught them how to play chess because mm. he would. Don't this video, but he would know when to jab, when not jab, mm. when to move forward, when to hesitate. It's like putting a pawn up to sacrifice to then use the um, bishop to take a, a. You know, you're sort of playing two moves ahead. That's where they right. always think three mm-hmm. moves ahead through chess. Um, I actually played chess when I was a child, like using like the fork and even me. Different, so yeah. So and I wish I carried it on, but actually because of my dyslexia, I actually for some reason joined the chess club. Goodness mm. knows why, but chess is patterns. If you use mm. the strategy of the board correctly, uh, and that's why well, I wasn't a bad chess player, I wasn't great, but uh, I can play a long game if you want me to play long for <laughs> that way. But all I'm saying is you could say chess isn't a sport, darts is a sport, but I tell you what, if you watch some of the darts um, and they have to go treble 20, treble 20, bull, that's the, yeah. the 170, mm. pressure to win. I think I'm not joking, great name here, Ted Hankey, did yeah. a 170 checkout, a win, the world title. Like, most people are like, sorry, I'll get my hand, nervous. It's like winning. Yeah. It's like a serving for Wimbledon, and it's on your mm. serve. And if you're like, receiving the serve, most of them are hoping, do a double fault and I win. Mm. They are thinking that. They would rather not hit the ball over the net to carry on the rally than then make the state to win Wimbledon. Mm. But that's my point. It's pressure. It goes back to the word pressure. And, you know, like anything, the 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 bigger the the the, the consequence, meaning losing, but the mm-hmm. higher the ward and that pinnacle, that in between us is the highest of pressure. Doctor Dave Aldred taught me that episode three hundred forty. Pressure is just how you perceive the consequence. Mm. If you don't mind, I'm going to share this case study. If you have, a, I've got my bin here. If, you, if I said, Tasha, here's a piece of paper. Throw that mm. piece of paper in the bin. You go, no mm. worries. If you missed, what's the end result? But I go now. Here's a fiver. You know, mm. if you get it in, you get this fiver. But mm. then I said, ah, oh, but if you get it in, it's a fiver. But if you miss, it's 50 quid you owe me. Oh, hello. Mm. <laughs> you know, <laughs> do you know what? I'd rather not throw the piece of paper in the bin in the first place. So why have I given that analogy? One, it's one of my favorite podcasts with that uh, Dr. Uh, Dave Alder. But also, you know, at the end of the day, the new, these new, spool, uh, these new mm. sports, the Olympics, all have all those components, even skateboarding. Right. No, mm. but what we need to stop doing is stereotyping these great mm. athletes who dedicated hours of time. So there's my answer to that quick one. Um, but uh, you know, with regards to how they pick the sports, unfortunately, that's not my area of expertise. So yeah, yeah, because uh, the thing is, whenever the new sports come, people are very curious about it. it how it's what are the rules and regulations? Mm-hmm. Because because uh, recently uh, I went to the symposium and Toshin Patel, who is the co-founder of Meraki Sports and Entertainment in India. So he gave this wonderful presentation, the future of sports. And uh, the thing is, I really very curious about it because how break dancing such an event can be, be so entertaining. Mm-hmm. If we saw uh, as a as a viewer, that's a, I think that's if adding such kind of events. It gives such a boost to the all the people who right now want to make their career into the dancing field. And it and it if it is a sporting event in the Olympics, it's a big plus thing for them. Because mm-hmm. not only you will be representing your nation, but you're also getting a recognition that you are an Olympian, yeah. you are an athlete. 100%. And that's, uh, yeah. So yeah. So last sets of questions. So let's move on to that. Uh so uh, apart from the sports podcast, what are the podcasts you follow, and uh, what are the books that you will recommend to the people that you should read about that? Yeah, no, sure. This is going to sound crazy what I'm about to say, but I'm I'm so true. It's very I, I do listen to audio books, yeah, or audio programs, but I don't listen to podcasts. Hear mm. why? Mm. Okay, everybody says that it's my art. 
It's my creativity. Oh. And when I started, you know, mm. I told that eight hours and I love taking action. You know, when I started doing my podcasts, what ended up happening was, oh, I want that person on my guest. And, and you end up like, and I went, no, it's like, you know, I'm a big Nadal fan and Federer fan. Like, Federer's got his craft. Yeah. Nadal's got his, like, two different uh, styles. And, and I just thought, and, and also I want to improve other skill sets of mine. Mm. You know, I get inspiration from reading. I do a lot of reading, mm. Tasha. Um, I can easily read. And this is bearing in mind, I told you at the beginning, I had a reading age of six when I was 12. Mm. I read a lot now. Like, um, I, I actually just love it. It's medit- I use it as meditation. Mm. But uh, like I say, I do listen to audio information mm. with audio programs, which I love. Um, and, and uh you know, so at the end of the day, I still listen to things. And also, I wear these a lot, man. Like, I yeah. need to, I want to, I want, I want these headphones off. Uh, <laughs> I really do. I want, I don't want, I have learned it's not, it's, it's not good to be always connected to technology, mm. uh, earphones all the time. So uh, even when I go running, I actually have no tech. I have my running watch to, to track my um, measurements of my 5Ks, but I try not to have much tech on me. But I know a lot of people listen to a podcast while running. And if you do listen to my podcast while running, thank you very much. But <laughs> for me individually, I don't uh, listen. Like, don't get me wrong. Now and again, hmm. I tell you one podcast I still really listen to is the Kobe Bryant Lewis House podcast. It's just phenomenal. Hmm. Um, his podcast, School of Great Poems, is fantastic. But it's very, very rare, Tasha. I, I listen to podcasts, um, you know, unless the individual or if somebody says, Ed, please, you listen. Mm. Um, and, and you know, I, I, I will, but it, it's not part of my daily routine. Yeah. That makes sense. But the books, I'm going to share a few. I'm sharing three because for me, there's so many. So I always say, I heard this tip for a good friend, as McCall is one of them. Uh, mm. he said, you should read a book in the area you want to specialize in, but then right. read a book that's non-relevant. Okay. Mm. So it's like, for me, I would, this is, uh, this year i read all all the lord of the rings I'm, i i do like lord of the rings uh, I, I love the journey and stuff mm-hmm. it's, it's just a great great story itself but it's a very hard read i had these books when i was in my mm. early teenage i just couldn't read it found too but i went no i'm going to give these another go non-relevant but my goodness his writing style tokens writing style is just amazing it's just like for me it's like so simple it just when i read something it's like off the page it's like next page please but at the beginning it was like Oh, scanning three or four times to understand the comprehension, you know. Right. But thankfully, due to I've listened to the audiobooks and I've watched the films, every time I read the book, I could picture it from the films yeah, or certain right. aspects. So mm. that's how I learned too. So don't be shy to learn from this method. But I'm going to go through three because this is so true of um, how I learn. So the first book I'm going to suggest um, is this one, Winning from Sir Clive Woodward. Now, who's he? And this is my generation here. So uh, he was the England coach for the 2003 men's uh, England rugby team who won the World Cup in mm. Australia. I don't, for me, that I don't know if you know this, but I'm showing my age here, but Johnny Wilkinson did a famous drop goal to win the World Cup right. uh, against Australia, which was ironic enough that it was against Eddie Jones, who's the current England manager now. But during this time, rugby was very amateur. So the book's called Winning. And yeah. when I say amateur, it wasn't professionalized what it was now. So even, I think, six months before the players were going to Australia, the players went on strike because they weren't happy with their contracts with the RFU because of, again, things were very amateur. Like some of them had trades. You know, one was an electrician, a club. You know, they had other aspects, you know, that was non-rugby right. related to earn a living. And it was only after the World Cup things changed significantly because, but also he was a really creative coach, Mm. really creative because again, coaches weren't paid what they are now. So he had to change the whole perspective of what winning meant. So Mm. here's one thing he did. This is, I'm going to give you some, and I live by this, some of the principles. England always, the men and women's team play in pure white. Mm. Um, and I used to go with my father to Twickenham to the Six Nations because it's near my birthday. And that was sort of one of my presents or the presents. Mm. I just love going. And I said, and some days it rained, Tasha. And we saw it was, mm. for some reason, always Scotland or uh, 
France. They're the two teams I always watch consistently, never Ireland or Wales, always those two. And this is going to make you laugh, but in his book, he has a thing called um, second half thinking. Okay. Mm. So when I used to watch these games, because this, this was a great rugby team. This is a team I followed. I studied like mad. Jason Robinson, Lawrence Diallo, mm. Martin Johnson, the captain, Phil, I'd go through the whole team, Ben Cohen, Josh Lucy. But for my favourite players, it was Jason Robinson. He was amazing footwork. Mm. And um, of course, Johnny Wilkinson, who was like, I'd call the conductor of the whole team. He just uh, a really tanned to play. Anyway, at half, when they come back on the pitch, the players, this is so true in the book. So the book wasn't out then. I said, Dad, look how white the kit is. Us. And this is, oh, you know why? It's the Scots, the, the Scots can't, or the French can't tackle. That's why. The, and, <laughs> and it was literally like, I said, nah, there, there's a, it, it was so, and it was muddy, like, but it was, they came out running and they'll, oh my. So this little thing I caught, I'm going, oh, there's something here. And um, do you know what he did? Half time, hmm. didn't matter if they were winning or losing, hmm. they would have a fresh kit. And he would say, players, we're back to, you know, clock of zero. You know, we're back to, you know, maybe the 40, uh, 41st minute, second half, but actually we're back to... So that's what he did. He played two games in mm. one game. Didn't matter if he was winning or losing. And and what he did was changing that, sec put it on the second shirt for the second half. Mm. It was a physical and psychological change of a fresh new half. Or, right. And I was like... Phew. You know, so you're going to laugh here, but during COVID, and actually before, because I always have worked at home, if mm. I'm having a real, like, imagine uh, England, and I did watch a few games where it was a bit tight, it was like 7-9 at mm -hmm. half time doing because of the weather. You know, that's not a great score because you have to, the next person's score is going to be significant to the score line, mm. you know, in the rest of the bigger picture of the game. Because it was never about the scoreboard, so Clive would, it was all about how they played and how they defined winning. Mm. But going back to this kit, I said, I'm going to, I'm going to use that. So there's times, Tasha, I've had a really bad morning. It's like, you know, when you have really bad mornings, do you mm. know what I do? I go, right. It's 11 o'clock. You know, I've ha I've been up from six to seven. I'm going this. Sometimes I go and have a damn cold shower. I change my whole clothes. I'm going, right. One o'clock, one to nine. I've still, you know, and it's second half thinking, you know, mm. so I use the two days, mm. you know, I use one day and define the beginning and the ending of a day. And it sounds such a crazy fun it sounds crazy what i've just shared with you but it's worked because but it's not it worked because i've just had a shower and changed a new fresher clothes i've had that physical and psychological change and same with meetings when i go to london mm -hmm. people don't realize this um i go and have meetings and when i go and see somebody yeah i always bring a, a spare polo or t-shirt in my bag always mm. And when you're in London, it can be a bit grotty and all that. I have a meeting. Right. So do you know what I do? Go above, I change a shirt so I feel fresh and I'm in mm. a social environment. And do you know what? People didn't even realize I changed my shirt. I said, and I shared this story with my, I said, I didn't realize you changed your shirt. And it was a totally different shirt. Yeah. <laughs> they saw me in a blue one and then yeah. they saw me in a nice white one. They didn't even realize. And so it's these little techniques of like mindset, mm. performance, you know, something as simple as that and it doesn't have to take a lot but during the pandemic when everyone was struggling this technique was a was a real really powerful because we all had tough moments in our own way mm. and and this second half thinking was amazing there's one thing i want to share in this book the second thing was he said to find winning and i shared this to you in that instagram stories going this is what winning means to me yeah. winning for sir clive woodward was this i can remember a handful of his bullet points one um, it was attractive rugby for the fans. Mm. Um, two, scoring a lot of tries. Uh, and, and the third one was like dominate in the scrum because that means you're getting the physicality. Like there were a few there I've just shared, but it was never about scoreboard. Never. Right. It was about mm. uh, another one was respect of um, off the pitch. They all wore suits and ties. If you see here in the image, I know you yeah. know audio, but they all wore the same. So they all look presentable. Mm. Didn't matter who they were. They also, it was all about standards uh, mm. and, and things like this. So that, so he defined what winning was, but a lot of time we think of winning of, oh, we've won that you've got 50 podcasts this year, Tasha, or I've got 350 mm. next year. No, no, no. Winning is, mm. is, is a standard, but when we experience it, we acknowledge it. So when he, like he, he went down to the detail, he said mm. every team, 
who went through five phases of the ball, hmm. 70% or something on those sort of lines, would score a try. That was the tension of detail. So he knew every five phases, hmm. and they're moving up the pitch. Uh, and if he achieved that, he was winning. Um, in this case, he was winning on the pitch or dominating the field. So I use that technique as well. I every year I do an exercise go define what you know define what I think winning on my podcast define what winning is or my business like, and when I define my winning, if if I mm. put my three or four bullet points and I see it in like when I saw that I was like I've won. I was like one of the winning of my podcast is that the the content is shared, but mm. through educational practice, meaning it's not you haven't just liked it and moved on. You've consumed the information shared. I've won because that was um what i wanted to achieve my podcast it wasn't that i wanted acknowledgement it was more that people are using it as a sports career resource you right. achieve that winning does this make sense i'm going really deep here i hope this all makes sense <laughs> i know people right. have listened to us for a long time but i'm decoding mm. through this one book the second one quite a modern one but it's helped me a lot and he had had another book called relentless is a guy called tim grover uh mm. his, his book came out last year winning he was He's always, he waits. there's a lot about his story now, but I knew about him back in 2016 when his books weren't out. Um, he's famous for coaching Michael Jordan, Charles mm. Barkley, and the amazing uh, Kobe Bryant, uh, rest in peace. So yeah. what I love about this book is, um, and I've experienced this recently, you know, I finished my podcast for this year, and he, he teaches like how you decode winning. Like you could be on right. the podium one moment, and then the next moment, you feel back to square one. I had that moment recently. I'm like, right, let's get mm -hmm. back to doing the reps on podcast because when I learn from Kobe or Michael Jordan during the, um, if they've lost a playoffs, you know, Michael Jordan one time, excuse me, went back on the court the next day. Right. Tim Grover gave him, is it 5 a.m., 6 a.m.? So is it 5, 6 or 7? And whatever his performance was the day before was a dictator what time he was in the gym the next day. 5 a.m. means of so bad performance he was back in the gym 7 a.m was those two extra hours were a bonus in bed you yeah. know and it, again what i love about this book in particular relentless is brilliant but what i love about this is really defining winning you more and I, I think what i'm trying to say to listeners is and i say this when i mentor people in the sports industry is you've got to know what winning means for your sports career because right. you're going to have moments of great periods and you're going to have moments where as I call you, you're putting in the reps. So that's that book. And feel free to ask questions after the third one. And I'm not doing this because he's a great friend now, but there's Alistair McCaw. He's written so many books. Winning. This is one I like because I've said this word quite a lot. Attitude, winning attitude and mindset. Mm. Or developing a winning attitude and mindset is the actual one. And what I love about this is it's very short read. You just literally read one chapter. It's mm. a couple of pages with a coffee. And I could just focus on that one certain component uh of you know really making sure my attitude's in the right place because we all tailor off we yeah. all do we all have bad when I, I say this in like when i say bad days it's really off the easy off the tongue and saying it but mm. really minute we all have moments when we're fatigued not just physically and mentally but when i with all these books what they all have in common it's all about that winning theme and that's why I want, when you sent me that i was like these are books when i'm not feeling great i pick one of these up read one mm. chapter and it puts me in the right state of mind for the mm. next task and it's sometimes everybody for listening i admit this is quite a long podcast so thank you for listening mm. to this long podcast but to create quick change all it means is a quick action mm. with right focus and right attitude Absolutely. if you achieve that you're fine mm. you know and there's a lot more other books i can share but for me uh, i think near the time of this year where i'm all about reflection I've just didn't realize how attitude and winning are so powerful mm. words. If you put them in the right focus and direction you want to go. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And I'll put the link down below. If people really wanted to buy this book, I will put down. Below. So yeah, thank you so much Jared, for taking your time out because I know this is the Christmas time. You would be busy, but uh, it's so grateful to have you on board for this session. And I hope, I know it's very long podcast for us. But I hope people who are really interested to how the things work outside in the sports industry and people who are working in the, in the different roles, they will definitely go now and to listen to this podcast. So thank you so much, Ed. Any last few words you want to add up before we leave? A real pleasure. Like, thank you for listening. I'm going to say this direct to the listener. Um, I always say to people with podcasts, it's not about 
the length. It's all about the content. So I hope the content has benefited you. Feel free to reach out to me, uh, Instagram or um, LinkedIn. If you have any questions with, our, with this podcast chat, but Tasha, I know we've been connected for a while on Instagram. Really admire what you're doing. Really admire your attitude as well. And uh, keep going, my friend. Yeah, thank you so much, Ed. Ed. Thank you everyone for listening to the end of this episode. If you really like our episode, make sure that you like and subscribe our channel. Also, you can find me and Sports Lawsuit on a social media platform. I'll put the link down below of our link tree link so that you can go and check us out. And if you want to know what are things that I'm doing, so just follow me on the Instagram. So it's a TK Sports Lawyer. So just find me on, as well as on Twitter and Instagram. So yeah, we'll meet you in our next episode. Until then, goodbye everyone.